you can but it's like i told you yesterday talking with elders on friday and then talking with some folks yesterday and even folks at movie tie class yesterday afternoon is the church the last five six generations has gotten to the point where when you come to church on sunday you know i've, I've talked to other pastors about this you have too I've talked about and talked with friends, family members who attend church services and different denominations. The expectation is when I come to church on Sunday, I expect to hear an uplifting message that gives me <laughs> comfort. Yeah. Yeah. That when I go home, I'm a little bit lighter than I was walking in to church Sunday morning. You get the Theref feels, right? Right. Therefore, don't talk about politics. Don't talk about vaccinations or COVID related subjects. Don't talk about my kids. Don't talk about public schooling being a religion. Don't talk about anything that i already disagree with it's well like right I, because those no, have all yeah. been those have all been the, the thing with intersectional right it's used in mm -hmm. a positive way for people to promote their agenda yeah. it's also used in a negative way to 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 um collectively pigeonhole a whole group of dissidents right correct it's it's so, an easy way to put everybody in the same basket right so all the things you listed you're that that's the white evangelical christian correct. talking conservative points that, yeah. conservative yeah, yeah. They, you're just tick marking all the boxes and they've already you know, especially press, they put you into that right, right. that bucket to say, oh, you're one of those people. Correct. I had three, maybe four different denominations of Lutherans in church yesterday for worship. <laughs> and all of them, shout out to Matt and his wife who came from Hudson, Wisconsin. They drove over an hour to come to church yesterday. I was going to say, that's like LaCroix. That's a long way. Yeah. So shout out to those uh, two for coming to Bible study. They actually showed up early for Bible study. So double points for you for showing up before the coffee showed up and, and most they, of your people and most of your regular members. Correct. Yeah. It was me, <laughs> the organist, my cantor, my wife, uh, my Sunday school director and my elder. And then these two, Yeah. and they're like, yeah, we, you know, we're from Hudson. We've been listening to the band books podcast and they come out of the Wells tradition. And so it was very interesting having ELCA folks, Wisconsin, Lutheran folks, Lutheran church, Missouri Synod folks. And, and maybe a couple uh, ELS guys from down by Mankato or former ELS people all coming to church yesterday. We had a baptism. And so that's why the ELCA folks were there. But I've had this exodus of ELCA folks into my church in the last year and Wells folks and Baptists and Roman Catholics. And I've got some reformed from Northwest Iowa, like all of these different groups of people coming from different directions coming to church. And that that political platform and the way that it took root in their congregation's polity mm -hmm. <laughs> is what ultimately in the past years has caused them to rebel against their family, their community, their church that they grew up in and to come because of this podcast, by the way, primarily this podcast, the warrior priest podcast, the stuff that we do for 1517, whether it be the blog or the conference streams, like they right. all came to my church because of that. So we were talking about that then after church that, or right before church, but it's, it's a very strange phenomenon now that if you're sitting in a pew in a church and you're upset or you have questions and you are not quite sure if, if it's you or if it's the pastor or the congregation or whatever it might be, you can actually go and get a, a live resume of other pastors by just listening to a podcast watching a live stream, you know, presentation, a, a online Bible right. study, read the right. book, whatever right. it might be. And it creates a completely different dynamic now when you sit and listen to your pastor thump on this political piece over and over Sunday after Sunday, and you're the one that seems like, well, maybe we're the ones who are out of step with the rest of the congregation and the church as a whole, because mm. we have questions, we're upset with this, we disagree with this, we're not really allowed to ask that question. Everybody else is dismissive of it, like you noted, with the jab. Right. And then you can say, well, I wonder if there's anybody else who thinks like me. I wonder if there's anybody else who's even having this conversation or if I'm just crazy. And uh, what the last year well. has proven, <laughs> you know, well, what yeah. the last year has proven with this podcast anyways, is that people found us by word of mouth and said, yeah, these two are having this conversation and they're actually attacking the question and they're doing it theologically, philosophically, they're addressing pop culture. They're addressing I, society. <laughs> yeah. I and, described it. I described it to somebody yesterday. It's like we're, we're two uh, like middling intellectuals that are, right. are, are ascribing ones. Or what do you say? Not ascribing. We're too old to be aspiring. 
Aspire, yeah. Well, that's not true. No, we what? are intellectuals at this point. We're old enough and we've read enough books that we can at least claim the territory. Wow. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. It's been so anyways, an enough about Scott Keith. Let's talk about Scott Keith. Oh yeah. <laughs> What's Scott, up, guys? Is your GoPro attached to your groin? Is that? Yeah. It no, is. It's, okay. it's his phone. It's his phone. It is. <laughs> So we're, just live, my, uh... we're just live on YouTube right now, so we're not recording this. So you can say whatever you want because no one's watching. <laughs> That's probably the case, though. I mean, our YouTube numbers aren't great. <laughs> <laughs> Never. We're not on. We're not on the official channel, by the way, either. This is a our Are own you, separate channel. Do you have a still set up? Because I see a bottle of isopropyl alcohol. <laughs> Sorry. Is that why you're in Montana? <laughs> <laughs> Moonshine? No, I'm. Uh... That's unfortunate. I'm living, I'm living out of a 10-foot trailer for a month. Oh, you, I envy you. That's Mallon my retirement thing. plan, baby. 10-foot trailer? Or a little bigger? Yeah. A little bit bigger than 10-foot trailer. I love my wife, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we have two beds. It's great. Oh, that's fantastic. By the way, happy birthday. Uh, Dr. Thank Scott you. Keith is 49 as of yesterday, right? Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Funny, we, were driving, on, we, were, we were on a 10-hour drive. And I was going to say, congratulations yeah. on uh, having no control over the fact that you've been here 49 years. Know, it's awful, <laughs> honestly. It's just like Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when we do hit record, um, we'll just free flow and talk about stuff, Two Kingdom okay. stuff, vocation stuff more than anything, just because that's kind of what well, our listeners are. Most and what we were just do. talking about is how... Um, how a lot of the people on the on our show they you know they've discovered us but not necessarily 1517 right so they don't maybe uh, even understand our relationship to the this uh, other organization <laughs> that's why we got a pretty, that, good e pretty good email yeah. about you guys last week oh yeah. did you yeah yeah well we nice. we uh we let we want to let 1517 know about us you know what's the, the <laughs> um what's that british show the it crowd is that what the name of it was Remember that British show about the IT guys that were stuffed in the basement of the company and then that woman sent no. down to manage them? Nope. Have you ever seen that show? That's you, that's you guys? <laughs> yeah, it was so. IT it's guys. IT right. They're, like, they're yeah. like, yeah. We're the guys with the red stapler in the basement. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I got my swing line, I'm good. That's, that's right, exactly. More than Preston, more than Maureen, more than Mark, more than Scott, Steve, Matthew, Paul, Melody. What book are you guys do, going through right now? We are actually, we just went through Luther's uh, sermons on John chapter 19? 20. Oh. 20. And no, the, we were in 19 last week. Yeah, 19. Yeah. Basically, he's arguing for the distinction between faith and love. And that in, uh, it's kind of a riff off the freedom of the Christian stuff, but that in matters of love, essentially, right, we give, we give way, we act charitably, we're kind, but in matters of faith... Not only do we not yield, but he's also applying that to the two kingdoms and when and how we must, as Christians, call out um, secular authority for being either anti-God or anti-Christ and not protecting the gospel. Yeah. And that was an, that's and, a new volume, new, newly published, and it's pretty clear why it wasn't published before. Yeah. Was <laughs> that volume 69? 69, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Luther's, Luther's pretty edgy. Yeah, it's, it's much more provocative than even a lot of other provocative stuff that Luther writes. So cool. we'll hit record here, and uh, I'm then recording. We'll dive right into that. Um, I don't know how right. we're going to get Scott, but we'll figure that out later. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> don't worry about it. We ha we have hit this thing bump. that we play. This thing. One more time. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Banned Books Podcast, episode number 205? Correct. 5, 205. And as always, we are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin, willin, maxin, and relaxin, not in Montana. Not in Montana. <laughs> and I am the aggressive gentleman, Donovan Riley. I wish I was in Montana. <laughs> I know, it looks beautiful. Man. It's nice. We're right, right on the Yellowstone River. It's great. I'm in Minnesota where today uh, my legislature is voting to take away parents' right to have their children immunized and vaccinated or not. <laughs> you think it'll pass? I do because they worked with California to tighten up the language. Mm. So it removes religious exemptions and uh, exemptions of conscience 
And for home schools, public schools, and private schools, parents do not get to decide whether their children are vaccinated or not for any reason. And any doctor giving too many medical exemptions will have their license revoked. That's the legislation that's going before the... Is that the law in California? I don't think so. It's very close to that. But in California, you're allowed an exemption for homeschoolers. You're allowed a religious yeah. exemption. Whereas that's why they actually... Either they flew out there or they had the senator from California fly here to help them with the language. Mm. So that it was airtight. Because I know in Connecticut and even in Tennessee now, they're working on the exact same legislation. But the, and the religious exemption thing is, is I mean, that's really a loophole. Because most right. of the religious exempting people are just doing it because they don't want to go through the hassle of the medical one. Well, that too. Because there's so much scrutiny on the medical one. I mean, you can basically, you can't really get away with it. Right. No, it's ridiculous. And, and so, and there's, oh, and our that. state, yeah. there's no, there's no conscience exemption here. It's only medical oh, really? and religious. Yeah. Hmm. Nice. So today, <laughs> as we didn't promise in the last episode, because I didn't find out about this until the end of last week from another brother of ours, Mr. Ruffner, uh, we have Scott Keith. Um, I don't actually not, know what, I don't know what this, Scott does for 1517. I just, this is not really less impromptu than usual he though. He just shows up. Right. And, I mean, we're, this is yeah. about as much planning as we usually do. Shh, quiet. Oh, sorry. We're not supposed to. Oh, wait a minute. It's, Scott's kind of our boss in a way, isn't he? This is a paid gig. Shut up. He, he's somewhere up the chain of command. <laughs> we, right? we, we, don't was, do any, was we don't do any planning on thinking about either. I was so up for two days that. memorizing the script for this episode. I don't know what you were doing. <laughs> I was at the altar doing the prayer of the church yesterday. I was reading through the questions I had for Scott. <laughs> what does Which Scott only, do? That's that was actually the question. half true. Yes. I was at the altar yesterday and I was checking uh, my messages from people in church who were texting me during the liturgy. Please send me that sermon. <laughs> so I'm Wait a minute. on my way Aren't out you of church I'm like, are you in, you're in church right you're in church right, right? yeah no, no? that's okay. the relationship we have in my church <laughs> people are like we know you're up there checking your email I'm like, fair, <laughs> enough. fair enough terrible I'm like terrible. i tend to drift i got short-term memory loss um so scott's on the day and um we're going to talk about whatever we want to talk about which is actually every episode so riffing off of what we just started with then um before we hit record before scott jumped in we were talking about not only the Luther stuff we read last week from John's gospel and distinguishing mm -hmm. between faith and love, but also what has happened within the church that, like I said yesterday, I had ELCA folks, Wells folks, LCMS folks, I had some Roman Catholics in church, and they've all come to my church either by way of the podcast and the book or by word of mouth because they, in the last year in particular, they've grown more and more disgruntled uh, with their congregation, with the polity of their congregation and intersectional politics, how it's infiltrated their congregation to become a part of the preaching and teaching. And every single person that's come into my church in the last year has said the exact same thing, which is I'm sick of the politics at my church. And then I say, well, then you're going to hate my sermons because <laughs> they're super political. But what they really mean is not political in the like Republican versus Democrat. They mean political as in intersectional politics. Yeah. And at least in Minnesota, for example, you're not allowed to talk about COVID in church. You're not allowed to talk about masking, lockdowns, especially vaccinations. That's a huge taboo topic. So what do they mean like destruction of autonomy or personal yeah. freedom or yeah. or attack of the family? Right. Racial Whether segregation. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so you have, you know, COVID, for example, has become this cult, this death cult. You have public education becoming a religion. It's been a religion for a while now. But you have all these religious institutions that pass themselves off, off as secular institutions. And then when people come into church and you preach at those institutions, you actually apply the law of God to those institutions, they get upset because it, you're attacking their God. You're attacking their sacred cow. So, Scott. <laughs> oh, boy. Right, is that in the relation to that, the whole conversation, because obviously everybody who comes into church they bring all of their presuppositions, their biases, their confirmation biases with them, what they want to hear in church on Sunday mornings, what they definitely don't want to hear on Sunday mornings. How do you then navigate that? Or how do you present that in such a way that you can catechize your people? Because like I said, someone complained about one of my sermons being overtly political. And my response just off the cuff was, you, you do realize we're Reformation Lutherans. <laughs> like the entire Reformation was a political movement. No, that's just Reformation Day. That's once a year. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's like saying the Athanasian Creed. <laughs> it's like we do it once, get it out of the way. How do you, how would you, or how do you um, like engage with that topic and address that topic then in a way that you're not basically saying like, no, it's like you take this line and you follow me along this line or you don't. 
That's interesting. I don't really, to be honest with you. Um, the at the end of the day for fifteen seventeen, I was just had this uh, discussion with um, all the leadership of the Lutheran Brethren because we were we were in a, an event in Minnesota, um, but obviously a, a very different area of Minnesota than where you live. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, politically and it was kind of interesting that we got there we were staying with gretchen ronovic who or at least staying, parked our trailer on our farm who is one of our newest authors um just wrote the book ragged mm -hmm. um and we were doing an event at her church and the people at her church are very politicized um towards sort of i'd say trumpian type politics mm -hmm. um and we got there and she said, you know, I've had five people walk up to me and say, I spent a week on 1517's website and I can't figure out if they're pro-Trump or not. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> in a way, I, uh, in a big way, I, I took that as a, <laughs> as a compliment, right? Cause, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I definitely, I'm definitely a, a political animal. Uh, I, most of my time, like listening to stuff is consumed with political podcasts and whatnot more than it is mm -hmm. even theological podcast or whatnot by a long shot. Um, but when I was having this discussion with the Lutheran brother in leadership, I, cause they had some concerns too. I tried to explain to them that we're, you know, we're not a church. Um, we're not a church. We're not a seminary. We're not even an educational institution. Um, we're essentially um, a evangelical organization and a think tank. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as that, those topics are engaged by our, different authors on blogs or whatnot, um, to the degree that it's in the furtherance of the gospel. We do that. Um, and same thing I'd say with talks, uh, but really being, we got, we got much less time with people than you do. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't, cate I can't catechize individuals over the course of a period of time. No, I can. Right. right? So mm -hmm. through thinking fellows, of course we do, but we don't, know them and we don't know we're doing it for the most right. part i mean somebody might get catechized over the course of literally listening to our series on the small catechism mm -hmm. um but they're not individually being catechized by us because i i mm -hmm. don't know them and i can't i'm not preaching to them or their their situation directly mm -hmm. and so it's it's different for us it's a, it's a lot more removed i mean the the you lb would say supplemental was, right yeah, absolutely yeah we're we're not a we never have seen ourselves as a replacement for church or pastors at best we're supplemental i mean really mm. my what i see is as one of the things we're pretty helpful with i think like with conferences is um providing a place for a lot of people but pastors to come to and kind of just get a break and to hear the gospel themselves because pastors they preach gospel a lot um but they don't get preached to a lot and so our conferences can be an opportunity for that. So supplemental to pastors, same thing like with craft of preaching to help to pastors. But we're not pastors. We're not. We're not even you know teachers directly in the church. Uh, we're trying to drive people to your churches, uh, mm -hmm. trying to get them interested in Reformation theology and Lutheranism enough that they come to your churches, and then you get to preach the law and the gospel to them and kind of decide what individual catechesis and instruction mm -hmm. they need that's we don't do that so much mm -hmm. we don't get the opportunity mm -hmm. for that right so what do you think then is the state of the conversation like again in the lutheran reformation tradition in particular because that's our wheelhouse what when you travel and you talk with folks what do you think is the state of the lutheran doctrine of the two kingdoms nowadays like where is that is that a conversation that people can even have anymore or is it's it something that's it's definitely a weird time. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I could say that a little bit more pejoratively, but it's definitely a weird time. <laughs> like, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know, even if you take it outside of the uh, Lutheran tradition, I think one of the weirdest things about our time, mm -hmm. and I think you probably feel this way if you're on either side of the political spectrum, but I'm not sure. I just know from sort of my particular mm -hmm. side that it, it's odd to me that there's just not conversation anymore. I actually say this theologically too. I mean, mm -hmm. one reason mm -hmm. I don't, right. I don't really spend any time on, on the socials is because the idea behind social media was supposedly that we can <coughs> connect with other people from far, far away and engage right. and have conversations and da, da, da. it's just not that, you no, know, it's, it's a silo. 
Yeah. It, it's not, it's a silo and it's a um, extremely sort of toxic environment where mm -hmm. literally if you say something that another person disagrees with, mm -hmm. you're, you're, if not broadly canceled, narrowly canceled. Um, are you, you, know, do you, are you aware by the way of how I brought down Disney? Are you aware of that com that story? I'm. I think it's unfortunate because <laughs> that is one of my favorite shows. But yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined the Mandalorian, man. You ruined Shall it for I all say of us, man. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> the uh, the interesting thing about social. I mean, I we've am. talked about this before. It's it's worse than just like a toxic environment. It's actually intentionally um, divisive. Mm -hmm. I think because that's you. True. Especially with the yeah, algorithmic control, I mean, they, you they yeah. they silo people intentionally, right, for right. marketing yeah. purposes. But then in, the yeah. side effect of that is, is that like you don't see contrary voices, and and right. it's not a platform for dialogue. You, yeah, because mm -mm. because you, you could type like a long form response, but I'm not going to read it. Like right. in a comment. Right? Yeah, and that's the thing too. Is that I'm, I'm as, that's a good uh, kind of confession there because I'm as guilty as everyone else. I my my patience for. Uh, that type of thing has been so narrowed, even in emails, that if you don't mm -hmm. say to me what you need to get across in the first two sentences, mm -hmm. I'm probably not going <laughs> to see it. I have to tell my staff that all the time. They'll send me these, you know, full page emails. I'm like, that's that. Right. That doesn't that doesn't work. I didn't actually see anything in there. Mm -hmm. Two Kingdom stuff, I think, is interesting though. Um, one of the things I think when, and I I I'd, I'd admit to you know being possibly wrong on this or being corrected too. When Luther writes regarding two kingdoms, he lives in a, just in a different situation than we do. Right. And it, yeah. I think that just always has to be acknowledged. I mean, for, for the most part, he's living in a sort of type of theocracy. Um, yeah. You know, he's got, he's got Christian rulers um, that are, I mean, not so much as say, is, I think in a defined way what's going on in England, but for the most mm -hmm. part are acting on behalf of God. Mm -hmm. Um, and when he calls them to account, you know, that's a, that's a pretty, I don't want to say easy because there are definitely times in his own history where it wasn't easy to call them to account, but it's easy. The argument's easy. Um, mm -hmm. right. Uh, because you're a Christian ruler, you're supposed to be ruling on behalf of God and you're acting against the word of God. So here right. we go. I can call you out. I mean, that's an, uh, that's an interesting thing to try to apply directly to um, the American politi political situation, but it's definitely more complex. Um, right. Well, we talked about that on the show in the past in regards to like Romans 12, for example, and the uncritical acceptance of Romans 12 in mm -hmm. relation to the government. And I've always talked about this, uh, Romans 12, the interpretation of it in relation to the rise of the Kaiser in Germany, for example, and the quietism of the German chaplains, where they said, well, the, the Kaiser's appointed by God. So we just do what he says. Like we just go along with it. You're talking Romans 13 more than 13. 13, 13 sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Apologies. Um, I'm, fun, not a, I'm not a pastor either. That, so I'm just, that was fun. <laughs> I never get, I never get to get people on scripture stuff. So that was awesome. Um, <laughs> no, but it's no, true. 12, I, le 12 leads into 13. Leads into it. You, yeah. So you need the context. The fun, that's a fun one because, um, I mean, that's sort of for Luke especially that's a place to go because you have the distinction between sort of the state church guys that yeah. basically went along even you know be um beyond that into the, the forced in even and to some degree after that to the mm -hmm. with the forced unions and all of that yeah. um germany had a history of that of course you know right um but then you have the example of uh bonhoeffer and sort of his <laughs> ilk that <laughs> I was thinking it's an interesting thing to say that uh, to ask that when Bonhoeffer participated in a plot to kill Hitler, uh, you know where where was he with that? Was that was that a sin? Was it not? I mean, that's right. like if you sort of get if you're teaching at the undergrad level and you get somebody to read the cost of discipleship or something and get into mm -hmm, Bonhoeffer, right. that's the first that's the first question they're going to ask. Yeah, you see right. how he actually put it into practice, and you're like, "Oh, is that what he meant?" <laughs> right. Tragic too, right? Yeah, he's definitely. killed like about four days before the his work camp is liberated by the mm -hmm. Allies. Yeah. Do you think then that there's an because you know in relation to Romans 13, in relation to what we were just talking about with Luther's context, and even referring back to the prophets, where you do have long stretches in Israel's history where theologically the prophets are being sent in because you have a godless ruler. Or someone who's taken over who's worshiping Moloch or something, and you have false prophets, 
And again, it's the same thing of, well, we're going to go back and read Zephaniah, and then we're just going to try and apply Zephaniah now. Yeah, that's going to be rough. <laughs> the same as like, okay, we'll just apply the two right. kingdoms now, or we'll apply you know, yeah. Bonhi for his situation now. Is that just a lack of nuance and a lack of, of just kind of understanding, like each generation is going to take that text and seize upon it? Because I, I guess I'm leading this into the danger with arguing and like, cause I read Bonhoeffer as a new Christian, which made me this self-righteous prig. Um, <laughs> especially cause I've memorized cost of discipleship. I broke the spine and bought a second copy. That's how important that was to me. That you time. that, you know, to hear that is, to, I, I know, right. I'm having a hard time believing it. Donovan. It was, it was, it was the, my last weekend and <laughs> 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 she promised me a good time in Vegas, but, um, <laughs> Is that what ends up happening then as we read that and then we try and create an alibi or a justification for mm -hmm. either sinning against the government and the governing authorities or going along with it and establishing again that that umbrella that theological or philosophical umbrella of well yeah but scripture says or but the lutherans yeah Ver, i know, think versus uh, versus asking that question of well yeah but doesn't it actually apply <laughs> in the present yeah time? but mm -hmm. here's here's i guess how i would i would teach this if i were being asked to teach it is that the th the reality of our situation is that we're in a different political environment and we have different possibilities open to us than did most people in human history right. now um you could argue that that's changing right you can argue mm -hmm. that that's getting worse and that your political options are getting fewer mm -hmm. and that's all that's probably all up for debate um mm -hmm. And most, you know, I probably wouldn't even argue with you too much on some of that, mm -hmm. but just sort of given the general context, um, our, our system allows us to act on our beliefs as individuals within a political context where our input um, is not just asked of us, uh, you know, every mm -hmm. two years or whatever, you know, it is in your district, but actually, mm -hmm. You know, the implication is that if you are to be a good citizen, that you should go give your input. You ought to go give your mm -hmm. input. The thing that's good, right, and salutary for you to do is to go right. to go participate in that political process. And it doesn't. And for you, it doesn't have to stop there, right? If you think that no. that's not a that's not enough for your conscience, you can you can run for office, or you can attend right. city county council meetings, or mm -hmm. try to get uh, you know lobby your state legislature. And I mean. And that's a good vocation. They, I mean, it's not, it's not, yeah. uh, it's not like evil, inherently evil to be, you know, a politician. Yeah. <laughs> I even think, I even think, you know, protesting within, you know, the, I, cause I remember when, when I was a, a young man, we were good friends with a couple that was older, quite a bit older than us. We used to play pinochle at their house every Friday night. Um, it's an old person game. Yeah. Yeah, it was an old person game. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the man, his name was Genos Mansky. You know, he would very regularly um, protest in front of Planned Parenthood uh, buildings mm -hmm. um, and had even gotten arrested a couple times um, for it. Now, I, you know, that type of political engagement is open to you in this mm -hmm. country. Uh, why he got arrested, I have no idea. Um, but, you know, it seems like there are there are some nuances there. But in general, those kind of those kind of activities uh, as an American citizen are open to you. I think it, it would it would and does get scary if that, it seems like that's starting to change. Um, mm -hmm. Because then, you know, sort of the argument I'm making about uh, in your vocation of citizen, how you can approach these things in this country starts to change. Right. Uh, now, the thing about a podcast is it goes everywhere. It's not just a lot of people in the United States. So there could be that's people true. in very oh, impressed yeah. countries hearing this. Well, we have saying, listeners in North Korea, actually. So. <laughs> yeah. Saying, saying, you know, those aren't my options. So what do I do? Mm -mm. And right. mm -hmm. the reality is that's, that's a, that's a wholly different situation. And I honestly, mm -hmm. I honestly don't know. Um, right. You know, I think you're, it sounded like your advice was act on your conscience. Um, right, right. And I, I think that's always good advice in these particular. Well, we, we, we've talked about, um, you know, being what's the what's the rule subsidiarity? I think that comes out of Roman yeah. Catholic tradition. But the idea yeah. that the best politics, actually the best, really ethical, um, you know, obligations are going to come at a very very local level, as you know, local to you as possible. Correct. Starting right, with yeah. the family. Vocation is <laughs> location. 
Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's true for politics, too. It's like people are always like, well, the federal yeah. government's doing this. And you're like, well, you're not going to be able to do much with that. Right. But, but what you, are you but doing? You, <laughs> you can you can serve in your community. You right. can serve your neighbors there. You can push you know, push back legislatively if you can at a state you level. Could maybe even create your own economy. You could do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's the North Korea situation. Go BTC. Maybe, oh, sorry. <laughs> you can't overcome the. You're not going to overcome. Uh, who, is, who runs North Korea now? Is it the sister? Is she in yeah. charge? Well, yeah. The sister runs I missed North a, Korea. I missed the whole regime. What's going on here? Well, well the, he's been dead for a while. but I think, yeah. He's either dead or it's hard. Or he's got a stand in. Yeah. No way. Yeah, no. He's got <laughs> dozens of stand ins, actually. They, like. <laughs> Like that's an old, How did like, I open. miss an entire regime in North Korea? No, it's the Not sister so that's going to run. That's running the Where show. Where have you been? Hey, right. I don't know, I don't know what you do under, before bed at night, but under a rock and Big Bear, living we, my we life a couple in trips. a subsidiary fashion. There you go. We made trips with Dennis Rodman. You know, that's right. Exactly. It was so funny. Is out. um, my son Caleb, who's much younger than me, um, uh, reminds me of this all the time because I get upset about the stuff. Because again, I listen to political podcasts, which I should, yeah. I'm trying to replace with cryptocurrency podcasts but um there we go they get, Gosh, that's they so get much you work they get you worked up too. um but down 10 percent today right okay bitcoin is by the dip baby all right um but Ooh, he's always he's always yeah. reminding me of you know we've got a pretty good situation up where we live in big bear mm -hmm. we're in a we're, we're in a rural community and we still have access to the the big cities. Um, mm -hmm. Most of my family lives within two miles of me. Um, right. We we can live this uh, this very local vocational mm -hmm. life most of the time, and right. mm -hmm. that's a that's a great blessing. And it's sure worth more of my time to think about that and right. my grandkids and our community and my neighborhood um, than it is to worry about what crazy people of either stripe are doing in Washington mm -hmm. D.C. Right. No, that's, and, you know, we, we've been talking about that here and then on the other podcast too of um, the whole, you know, vocation is location, your neighbor is who's ever, you know, right in front of you. And how do you, how do you then act to create a community or a new culture, create an economy and that almost locally if you need to, like what we're doing here. Um, but also then, you know, underlying that is we're children of enlightenment humanism. And we've right. talked about this in relation to like Jordan Peterson and other intellectuals who talk about individual sovereignty, individual Hail rights. Lobster. Yeah. Hail lobster the shirt today. Look oh, that. look at you go. Like subliminal messaging right there. Um, <laughs> but yet, when you walk into the church, you're part of the community of saints. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an added wrinkle back to the original point, because, again, sinners love to justify sins by pointing out other people's sins. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, but he's way more sinful than I am. It's like and talking since, about the world and not recognizing that you're just as worldly as correct, what you're right. talking about. Yeah. yeah. Complaining yeah. about the downed tree in the middle of the path, in the middle of the woods. <laughs> like, just move it out of the way. Right? Hey, wait right. a minute. I'm, I did that this morning. What are you trying to say? <laughs> That's right. Honey, get my chainsaw. <laughs> fix this. <laughs> but also then, how about, I mean, on that side of things too, because I think we, especially Gillespie and I, and I know you too as a teacher, <laughs> you, you know, you have people coming into you who they don't even, they're not even aware of their presuppositions and how radically individualistic they are. Mm -hmm. when they're coming into a group of people, whether it's a classroom, whether it's a congregation, whether it's even a workplace, and recognizing in your vocation, you're here for other people. That's literally why you were created, is to yeah. serve and love others, yeah. be an instrument. In fact, this came up again yesterday in our Bible study, because after 12 plus years, my folks are still bucking against individual agency versus instrumentality. And mm, and because yeah. we had a baptism yesterday, yesterday, like you're an instrument of the Holy Spirit that this child might be baptized and brought into the kingdom of Christ, right? And they're like, "What?" I'm like, "This isn't about your choice." We chose to decide. We right. decided to baptize. Exactly. Like, wait a minute, God used you, <laughs> and like, just uh, as He's using me to right. pour the water and the word over this child. Mm -hmm. And as old Freddy used to say, and that's why I say it too, is, "No, God does give you a choice. You do have free will." The problem is you just make the same choice every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rebel against God and choose death. I mean, yeah, right. this is why we keep inventing. Like, this is why we keep just digging up the same death cult and then rebranding it over and over and over again. Yeah. Because when you turn and you look at your neighbor and you're like, hey, can you save me from all of the things and everybody in the world that could possibly kill me today? You've turned away from God. We were reading this in Jeremiah 17 yesterday. Is that... 
you know, cursed is the cursed are you if you turn toward men and rely on them for your strength. Hmm. And you see this over and over and over again. Obviously, it's a generational curse. But I think it also, again, to dig into the underlying reasons for why people, no matter where they're, you know, you walk into a group and rather than focus on what's right in front of you, like with social media, like we brought up, you just kind of take off into the stratosphere of abstractions right. and generalities because it is all about you on social media. And like you said, the algorithms are designed to silo people. It's not even you. It's this artificial version of you anyway. Well, especially that part of it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's an artificial, which then I think actually dehumanizes you in real time mm -hmm. and creates an artificial yeah. version of you in real time, which is why you, you'd see people have such a, a negative relationship with their own bodies, for example. Yeah, and because you, you have an artificial community, artificial right. bodies, artificial even, what it was the Instagram filter, right? That's the artificial body. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like Nietzsche pointed out that that's the reason we hate to eat. Because eating reminds us that we're mortal, and we hate being reminded that we're mortals and not gods. <laughs> huh. well, you know, well, in, say about people that love to eat. Hmm. <laughs> it says we have a really healthy relationship with our body. That's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, it's like the student, the student that asked Ferdy, "Why do we sin, Professor Ferdy?" And he laughed. And he goes, "Because we like it." Yeah. <laughs> and she was super offended. He's like, "Name one thing that you do that's not sinful." Well, we're completely sinful, Doctor Ferdy. Mm -hmm. Okay, then that means that all the stuff that you like is sinful. She's like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I like that you that you said um, you brought, went into the the reason you're here is to serve others. Um, yeah. Sometimes when I teach the evangelism and apologetics class, I, if we have time, I always get to the the part that you know if you're ever su successful, you know, and it'll certainly saying that you're successful is an odd way to say such a thing if you know you were ever used <laughs> mm -hmm. and by the power of the holy spirit this coming person comes to christ uh the the first thing that'll likely happen is they'll get really excited about mm -hmm. their new life right they're mm -hmm. gonna get really excited about their new life um and which is a, a great joy to watch um, the second thing that's going to happen is they're going to want to know what they can do for god because right. they've lived in this sort of tit for tat payback system in their, their entire life um somebody does something good for me even if it's you know my parents gave me a great christmas oh mom's birthday is coming around i better do a good job type thing we've always we want to Im impress the giver um and when you tell them that oh uh, in fact you can do nothing for god mm -hmm. um that he doesn't need anything from you that you couldn't supply anything that would be of any use to him um they get a little forlorn, um, mm. which is kind of fun as a teacher because you can come right in and say, ah, but of mm. course he didn't create you so that you could provide things for him. He did right. though, create you so that you can, you can be a little Christ to right. the people that he's given you in your life. Right. Um, isn't that actually what it means to be made in the image of God is to be an instrument, yeah. Yeah. to be his image acting in the world. Yeah, that's good. Well, that's George Carlin's old bit that, you know, the reason he's an atheist is because God loves you, but if you don't loan back, he's going to send you to hell and he needs your money. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, maybe God doesn't need your love. Maybe he needs a better accountant. That's pretty much evangelical <laughs> preaching in a nutshell right there, isn't it? It really is. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we should get better at that at 1517 and make fundraising a whole lot easier. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Well, you, yeah. there's like a, there's a next step after the excitement of wanting to give God your gifts is if you have a preacher that preaches against that, you eventually, you just throw up your hands and say, well, since I can't do anything for God, because it's all done for me by God, I don't have to try anymore. This is why you always invite people that are new members to be on church council, because they don't know they're any gonna better try. yet. Yeah, because yeah. they're like, absolutely, I'd yeah. love to be a trustee. Yeah. Good. Here's when can I mow the lawn? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. I, I actually intentionally don't do that because it pretty much destroys their faith when they That's see what, what people saying. are actually like. like. Yeah. <laughs> Green pastors jump on that so yeah, fast. Yeah, I always <laughs> recommend that, that uh, people don't attend a church council meeting or a voters meeting yep. until they've been a Christian for like 10 years. <laughs> At least, right. right? Get them good and locked in before you let them see the dark well, that's, underbelly. That's also... That's also why you don't want to be a pastor right away, right? Right. Like a new convert, yeah. because it's not so much that you're like overzealous, it's that you're too zealous and you're not a realist. 
I can't remember who said it. it was either Nesgan or Ferdy said, I hope I don't die at a church voter meeting because I'm not quite sure of where I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> My wife would go to a, a voters meeting probably for the first, Five, six, I don't know, I, I'd even go maybe 10 years that we were married. Yeah, um, no, Annie didn't attend until last year. So yeah, 11 yeah, years in, it she finally could have been long. It could have even be longer because I think the first one yeah. was at Bethlehem towards the end of us being there, mm -hmm. which would have been closer to 20 years. Yeah. And she went the first one she went to she's like this is horrid i, I mm. what these people i yeah. i know these people why are they acting this way they're horrible you really people. don't until like, you've attended a voters meeting you actually yeah. don't know them yeah. we pray for a boring one right oh so much <laughs> yeah <laughs> just wish they oh actually boring. the first one she went to was when the church was deciding whether to release our pastor and it oh. was truly oh. it that was like truly fun. Oh, it was truly horrible. It was I've truly never been horrible. to one of those before. I can I imagine no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Just... Oh, that was the worst. It was the worst thing ever. I guess. Oh, I'm sure. My uh, yeah. my oldest Owen announced that he was thinking about possibly becoming a pastor last year, <laughs> so I immediately nominated him to become an elder. Uh, <laughs> of course, everyone's like, "Hundred percent, we need young blood." So now, as an elder, he has to come to the church voters meetings. So yesterday he comes home after his first actual like fully blown voters meeting where all the old ladies came back to church and he, I walk in and he goes, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> I go, that's your future. If you want to become a pastor, <laughs> I thought you were going to say you just smacked him across the head. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, snap out of it. <laughs> no, I went in my room and cried for about 10 minutes and then pulled myself together. I'm like, yeah, whatever you want to do, son. You know, you know, Scott wrote a book called Being Dad. He knows something about this. Right? I know. I'm supposed to read I it. I tried to Let's talk my son that. out of out of going into theology, like big time. I tried to mm -hmm. talk him out of it. Right. I steered him to three different majors. Um, 100%. Uh, really, and it just didn't work. I know. We've got him working at a butcher shop now, so we're hoping that changes him. <laughs> He's like, Dad, should I work at a butcher shop or a bookstore? I'm like, well, I can't eat a book. So, <laughs> so go to the butcher shop. I'd rather like have free Reese, bacon. Reese on Malcolm in the middle. Coming home so, exactly. so here's, here's a serious question. Which is worse, the son going into the pastorate or going into church music? Oh, well, <laughs> church music. Church yeah, music. I think, so. yeah, I think that's worse. Well, because it pays why, even less. Because why? Yeah, I would say it pays less. And why? Why? put yourself through that and yeah. then give yourself a job where you have literally no control. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know all those hymns you hated growing up? I'd like you to play those repeatedly for the next four decades. Yeah. <laughs> With the vibrato on, yes. No, no. Make sure the tremolo's going. Tremolo. Honestly, it's like marrying a woman that you know steams all of the vegetables. Like, she just boils all the food. Like, she doesn't know how to cook. Boils. boils food. Yeah, boils. Yeah. She just boils food. <laughs> <laughs> God. Lord have mercy. Oh, so anyways, God. being dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you still but, on tour for the book? Is, yeah. that, is that what's going on? Uh, when people ask. Um, I mean, I was on tour for nothing last year. It was... Um, Nobody was 20, on tour. Yeah. 20 gigs canceled, I think, last year. Oof. Right. Yeah. Which Speaking was, of which, it, yeah. It was kind of nice. Um, I I needed to stop, and it was it was getting, yeah. it was hard to like slow down the momentum. Um, mm. I mean, kind of you get in the habit of it, and people mm -hmm. get in the habit of asking you, and it's hard to slow that down. So it's nice that it has. I appreciate it. Right, yeah. but you have the opposite problem too, though. I mean, we've had this as as pastors, right? It's like trying to get, actually get back up to speed after that. Obviously, you can drop yeah. some things that you were doing before that you really didn't need to be doing, right? But yeah, and I think that's for me. That's I didn't need to be doing. I mean, back when I started, I kind of the speaking thing. It was a, a big supplement to my income, and it was kind of mm -hmm. important for our family life and everything. It's not. It's not as much the case anymore. And um, because your official title is executive director executive 15, director at 1517 yeah. sounds so i've got a real anyway i got a real job now and so um it's it's important to do for promoting 1517 but we have enough speakers so now that are on payroll that the load can be spread around uh, right. more same thing with writing um mm -hmm. i don't write much anymore and that's kind of why we have we have 30 people who write better than me so let them do it mm-hmm mm -hmm. Speaking of which, uh, next year, tentatively, conference in Vegas? Yeah. Yeah, so we canceled the big one and mm -hmm. um, in San Diego. Well, it wasn't going to be in San Diego anyway. It was, it was going to be in La Jolla. 
right. which was a, diff- a different venue for us. Uh, mm-hmm. We had done the live stream from that venue the previous year, and they were nice and everything, but it was just awkward, and there were some there were some times, you know, mm-hmm. where it, it was good to be able to see that venue mm-hmm. um, without 500 people there. And, sure. And then I just was not very confident. Here we still stand. The big the big conference has a definite uh, ethos to it, and it's mm-hmm. not an ethos of social distance, no. possible mask wearing. No, it's no. an ethos when of you, people hugging each other. Put, and, yeah, when you put several hundred former evangelicals together in a room, there's a lot of flesh pressing. Like there's yeah, there's yeah. a lot of full body hugging. Yeah, and so well, which, and that and that I, was the original conference, right? The large conference. Then you had the regionals yeah. later. Yeah. yeah. So this will be a regional. It's over the same weekend. It's, um, uh, I always forget the name of the church. Is it Grace? I don't remember. Uh, Bob, Faith um, Community Lutheran Church. Faith, thank you. Uh, Bob Sunquist Church there in Vegas. Mm-hmm. It'll be a great time. It'll be different. Um, it's not, you know, we did a regional event in Bentonville, Arkansas, and it was great. It was different, but it was really good. The talks were really good. I'd say it's a little less, um, when you do when we do the big event, and you're all in the same hotel and everything. It makes it much easier to yeah. sort of yeah. socialize mm-hmm. into the wee hours of the morning. So that's probably not going to be the case at this, but it'll still be a great event. So people can mm-hmm. check it out. Cool. Sean has a question. Why are reform people always with the hyphenated last names? What's up with that? <laughs> is that a Dutch? <laughs> is, that, is that a Dutch? Is that an name? actual question on the screen? It yeah. is. Yeah. 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 I, I would wondering... need like. Glasses with like the, the plus two. Do on Lutherans them concern season? themselves with covenantal theology? No. Next question. Well, we yeah. definite. We don't use the same definition at all, right? It's testament instead of covenant. Right. New Testament. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think we don't buy into the epoch thing either. So this epoch and that epoch. I don't. You mm. know, this covenant and that covenant. Oh, that's right. That's caught up in there too. Yeah. Yeah. So no. Next question. Isn't that, isn't that what the formula calls that Jewish opinion? <laughs> it does. It calls it a Jewish opinion. Yeah, There's the age of the, the age of the Father, the age of the Son, and then the age of the Spirit. That's Joachim of Fiore. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. A crazy guy on an island with too yeah, much. Yeah, we've covered him before. <laughs> Did we? What? Yeah. Well, we talked. We we got to go back to him. It's been a while. But yeah, Joachim of Fiore, probably 800s, right? Ninth mm-hmm. century, tenth mm-hmm. century. Yeah. Again, it's it's like the Gramsci thing we talked about. It's like, why do you find the most failed intellectuals and then ride their coattails into the future? Like, like, like what is it about that? We're like, well, this guy's dumb. Let's follow his philosophy. Like, this guy's an obviously insane theologian. Let's ride this one out for the next couple centuries and see how it He's works. He's probably got it all figured out. To, to yeah, Sean's absolutely. question, this this probably would would belong in another show where we read something. So yeah. I'll save it for later. Covenantal theology. Well, and covenantal right. theology obviously has changed just in the 20th century so much sure, sure. more than, you know, Reformation covenantal theology coming out of Geneva or other places, just yeah. as much as Lutheran theology has changed radically. Wow. Okay. Oh, was so I supposed to that. add to that? Sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> I was just allowing space. I'm trying to be a good person today. I'm trying to like not talk through the entire show. <clears throat> don't know what you're talking about. I don't know either. I'm just, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Law, gospel, two kingdom theology. Okay, I guess. Right on. Uh, we'll see what time is it, because we got you for an hour. I don't want to take your time yeah. here. Well, I had something to say, but since you're minutes. not, are you going to be kind or, or gentle? No, you, you know? do it. Gillespie, go. Scott, so you said you said 1517 is like a think tank, which is kind of ironic, since that's generally attached to uh, political institutions that manipulate the parties and tell them what to that's true. You know, write the bills for them and the whole deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, how how do you how do you see that spin out? Fifteen seventeen provides some intellectual, you know, uh, influence then into the church. Is that is that kind of what you mean? Yeah, um, in, into um, sort of the theological conversation at the very least. Um, one of the things that it's, uh, has struck me lately is that fifteen seventeen has managed to bring together some of the best theologians from all of the various, or at least most of the various Lutheran denominations that I'm Mm -hmm. aware of. Um, I mean, we've got some of the best people in the ELCA that write for us Mm -hmm. regularly. Um, Some of the best in the NALC and the LCMC, uh, even from the Lutheran brethren from the LCMS. Um, And it's just, it's uh, the goal all along was to get enough input, um, from the best people we could from all over 
the world and country, um, most of whom are Lutheran, mm -hmm. um, to contribute to the Reformation conversation and the proclamation of the gospel, be it, you know, in print or right. at a conference or on a podcast. And we've done it. And it's, it's, it's hard to, to estimate, you know, how important that is because people have tried to do that in Lutheranism for years. I mean, one of the things that was kind of funny with the Lutheran brethren leadership is he was, the, one of the guys was pointing out to me that my talk reminded him of why people could never get together in the, the Concordia discussions of the 1860s mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. I actually thought those discussions were a little bit later, but maybe he's right. Um, and 1880s. Yeah. I said 1880s. Yeah. yeah. That's good to know. I was right. Okay. Um, yeah. But the, and he seemed, he seemed um, happy that they weren't able to figure anything out back then, you know, <laughs> that they weren't, he, he seemed very content with that and upset with me that, I wasn't as content with it. Um, and it was just interesting to me because I literally, I said to him, I said, you know, I, it's hard for me to be proud of what I've accomplished at 1517 because there's been so many people along the way that have held me up and helped. Um, but I am proud of that. I am proud of that. I think it's, it's amazing that we have enough respect and enough um, mm -hmm. people that respect us personally and publicly right. to give of their time and energy um, really, really smart right. people, good communicators, great right. writers and speakers to do this. And it's, right. it's phenomenal. And so we'll never be writing um, motions to go on the floor of an LCMS uh, <laughs> convention. That's not going to happen. And those I are just, pointless I anyway. So right. well, to yeah. be clear, and I kind of had to tell us, I just don't care. Like I just, right. I, it's not, that's just not my thing. I'm not, right. we're not trying to make it better for you and your congregation. We're trying to make right. it a clearer path for the proclamation of the gospel mm -hmm. and reformation theology. And right. honestly, to drive people into your churches. Yeah. So that, well, that's, if, that's not like a traditional ecumenism at all, which is like right. the most no. common denominator. Right. Yeah. But we're trying, I'm trying to keep the, get people to ride on the highest co common denominator, right. which is mm -hmm. Christ right. crucified for the sinner. Correct. You know, and we just have keep this, it orthodox. Yeah. Um, we we actually had this conversation because like we started off with can't remember if it was before we hit record or not right is that you for the past year now especially the past six months I got ELC people coming in Wells people coming in ELS people coming in Baptist Roman Catholics coming in and joining my congregation and that's been an interest like two points right one is that I didn't really know let's say ten years ago where the breakdown of denominationalism was going whether it was going to turn into this just kind of mm. fondue pot of American evangelicalism and we'd all just eventually be mixed into that or, or what. And then because of COVID, especially last year where people had three, four, six, even 12 months to sit at home and really think about why do I go to church and why do yep. I go to that church? And do I really even believe what that church teaches? Yep. And then you have people coming in and like I said, what's been really remarkable to me is you have all these different strains of Lutheran coming in and even non-Lutherans asking like, what did you just preach? And I like it, but I don't know why I like it. There's something, yeah. it's like, again, the two, the Roman Catholic family that came for the baptism. They're like, that was really, that was almost like our service. Mm -hmm. But that thing that you did with baptism, we're not like, we're not really quite sure what you just did there, <laughs> you know, talking yeah. about regeneration and the saints and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I think that's the Congratulations, point. Congratulations, you're a child of God. <laughs> you right. Know? And it's like, it's like, wait a minute. Wait, right. They've got more but, they have to do. No, they're here. <laughs> no, and Paul says right here, actually. Yeah, well, Not well, even just more right. now, but more later too, right? right exactly. Right. The so, much more. Thing. <laughs> so much more to do. But I think that's the benefit of 1517 to your point is that we're not saying let's dissolve everything into this, like you said, Gillespie, right? Let's let's just dissolve everything into the lowest, like aspire downward to the lowest level of theology of just like, let's just agree that amen means amen. And just, and then yeah. you do what you, you do you. All Versus, we need is love. Yeah. yeah, all we need is love. Versus what I've experienced anyways as a pastor is people coming in and going, not only am I challenged by what you're preaching and teaching, but I actually want you to do it more because I've never actually, no, it's like the confirmants when I have kids come in for catechesis from other churches and they're like, well, how long do you do this? I'm like, four years. They're like, four years? I'm like, yeah, four <laughs> years. <laughs> and they're like, and then they go through all these other questions. And then I invite the parents and other new members just to come to catechesis classes with the kids. And they do. 
And so you've got all these people, adults and kids, who's coming out, coming out of these other churches, and they're asking these specific questions, catechetical questions, liturgical questions, why do we sing this way, why do you preach this way? And they're hungry for it because you're basically saying there's all this stuff that you've never been exposed to that's going to set your hair on fire. And the law, preached lawfully, is really going to punch you in the face. But then the gospel yeah. preached evangelically is going to be like so much more than you thought. It's like when you read Robert Capon for the first time. And you're like, yeah. I understand the gospel. I know how, I know where the gospel is. And then Capon's yeah. like, well, actually, if you want to follow me in the ocean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll show you how deep the gospel actually is. I think that's so important. I mean, one of the things that we sometimes get accused of is not preaching the law. And then I'm like, that's absolutely ridiculous. Just listen to Don and Riley's talk from Austin. Um, right. I mean, the, the reality is that we preach the law, we teach the law, we write the law, we just write it so hard right. um, that people don't see it as the law because what they're normally, what they normally mm -hmm. get is, well, you know, you should try harder to be a better husband. Like, and if you did that, you know, yeah. Jesus would love you more. And right. that's what they get instead of they get death. They get right. killed. They get, yeah. you know, eviscerated, not just punched in the face, but they come out of it gasping or not at all because they're dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, sort of like I was thinking when you said punch in the face, I'm like the gospel then is punch in the gut, but it's more <laughs> like the two hands over your chest doing compressions right. um, and bringing yeah. you back to life. And, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, both of those are shocking experiences. And, uh, well, My goal is always not yeah. that we dumb anything down that we do, but that we do it um, yeah. as in accordance with Scripture as possible and right. as hard as possible, mm -hmm. as voraciously as possible, as passionately as possible. And that's not going to be Mamby Pamby. That's not going to no. be Jesus for a better checkbook or mm -hmm. just try to be a better husband and everything will be okay in your marriage because it won't be. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I think now more than any time, because at least where I'm at, so many churches have closed permanently uh, in the last wow. year. And in my state, certain Lutheran denominations have agreed not to do anything unless the governor says they're allowed to do it. So they've remained closed until just the past month. And you just see people wandering around wondering, like, what do I do? Where do I go? What do I believe? What do we actually confess? And I have the same attitude toward kids. It's like I teach, when I teach kids, I tell them the same thing. I'm like, I'm assuming you're hyper intelligent and I'm going to treat you like you're intelligent. Yeah, that's the way to do it. And treat the adults the same way and say, you need this because your whole problem isn't, like you said, your whole problem isn't that you're a bad husband. I mean, you are, but other than that, more deeply, the reason you're a bad husband is these reasons. And we yeah. need to really dig deep into how sin manifests itself. That's the that, part. Yeah. Here's you gotta, a, here's you gotta, that old Adam's got to be killed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and preaching's put, not and, not a near death experience, <laughs> right? And I think we no, talked about this on the podcast life. like two years yeah. ago, almost now. Of when you recognize pastorally that when you talk about baptism and you haven't connected it in a concrete and real way to vocation, and then you tell people use your baptism, live in baptism, and they leave church and they get smacked in the face, or they you know they they're they're bombarded with attacks, satanic attacks, or death. And they come back to like, I didn't, you told me to use my book, my book, like use my baptism, but this thing happened. And I like, I, what do you mean? What are you even talking about? Use your baptism. And the, the kind of failure to teach vocation in relation to baptism and recognize that that's where you bear your cross at. Your, your, the cross is put on you in your vocation to the other, to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that the old Adam's whole project then is to say, can I just give up chocolate for Lent? Isn't that like, is that better? Like, isn't that just the same? Listen there, Riley doesn't life? believe in sanctification. Huh. It's yeah, true. right. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't spell yeah. it, I don't believe in it. Well, you don't believe it. You don't believe ironic it. Ironic like that we a, should have like ironic criticisms. <laughs> <laughs> right? It was just like we were talking about with politics. It's, you don't apply it in this large scale, systematic way, like yeah. at a high institutional level. It's, right. it's, it's yeah. local, it's particular. You look at the person in front of you and, and you well, say, what, what love right. do they need from me? I think we've all experienced at the institutional level how little consequence there is for anything that's said. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're, you're, you're in a box with like 30, 40, 50 people and they're all staring at you like, you're the expert, you tell me. 
And then something yeah. falls out of your face and they're like, that sounds good. And then they <laughs> leave and they go off into their vocation and then you run into them at a conference or something and they're like, hey, remember that one lecture you gave? Yeah, that was total BS. Like I got smacked in the face so hard for trying to apply that in my, in my church or my job. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the struggle there or, or however you want to phrase it of if your vocation isn't concrete and real, then your, is your faith concrete and real? And then what exactly well, are you going, what are you You're still going to be, you're going to be looking for sort of day-to-day -day application and you're going to go mm -hmm. to something goof, goofy, wonky, or just right. plain wrong and harmful. Well, if false preaching of that. sanctification is what you'll go to. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course, I mean, righteousness. You need, yeah. You need, you need to know that your sort of Christian life is lo lived out day-to-day -day in a very right. sort of, uh, common fashion that'll be hard to recognize because it'll be so yeah. normal. Um, right. But that's not so is. much anymore though. Right. I mean, if, if, if the family's destroyed, if the communities are broken down, uh, you know, you're, you're making you're me eating, depressed there. Gillespie. If you're eating crickets in your high rise, you know, apartment <laughs> that has been, <laughs> <laughs> that's, I'm that's not, not very normal. <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm just imagining like some guy like Renfield and Dracula, like just scuttling on the floor of his high rise, trying to catch crickets in the corner. No, no, no. It's the cicadas taste like shrimp. I saw it. I saw it yesterday. Oh, oh yeah, no. absolutely. There were I cicada can, recipes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, on awesome. cicada tastes like shrimp. I gotta go. <laughs> that's a good place, Dad. I like that. That's for our show. That's a perfect place to end, actually. <laughs> so if you want to find out more about Dr. Scott, I, if you don't know who Scott Keith is at this point and you're listening to this podcast, I'm, I don't, I, yeah. It's all in the show notes though. So. It's all in the show notes. Scott's the best. His wife's better. Um, yeah. Say hi she, to Joy. She's pretty good. She's right here. She can wave. Say hi. Morning, Joy. Hi. Here. She's trying to make puppy behave. I like oh, you. Nice. There's Joy. Hi, Joy. I like her. We're about best. to head into Yellowstone. Cool. Beautiful. Well, enjoy that. And, uh, Remember, you're a child of God, and you're sanctified, and therefore you can walk freely amongst the bears. And um, I'm going to. And they I will not harm you. The bears. They will not harm you if you have true faith. They They're will like not snakes. harm you. Yeah, right. You can handle snakes. If I walk have with true the bears. faith in a 44. They won't harm me. Before we get off, though, have you ever have you ever watched uh, Grizzly Man, the documentary Grizzly Man? Yeah, that's horrible. Okay, so there's a there's a clip of the making of that where Werner Herzog, the director, is listening to the actual audio of the dude being eaten by the bear. Yeah. Yes. And he takes out the, and you can't hear the audio. You can just see his face. He takes the audio and goes, no one should ever listen to this again. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. And, and with that, I would say the same for this podcast. So <laughs> thank you to Dr. Scott Keith for joining us today. Go check out all the other podcasts in the 1517 Podcast Network. Go to the website. Go to 1517 Donate if you would like to support the cause. Otherwise, you can send an email in and tell everybody how much you love the show and us talking about law and gospel, two kingdoms, Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Otherwise, we will see you for a brand new episode. Peace. That's the official end. That's the official end. Thank you, Scott. We're still alive. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> so, All right. Peace thanks, out. sir. Enjoy. Bye. Have a good day, guys. You too. And he's gone. Okay, now we can actually now have the real we can podcast. talk about him. That's right. right. Now we can let's do a breakdown. A <laughs> well, I thought we might actually. E actually, thought we might because you didn't let me talk. Shut up! I, what? I had oh, all wow. kinds of dramatic pauses so you could talk. No, it's okay. I just think faster than you. It's otherwise. And by that, I mean I have less of a filter than you. <laughs> otherwise, we're going to talk on top of each other. So you know, that's just how it goes. Who cares? Yeah, it is interesting. He said he's a political animal, but but he doesn't bring it in. You know. I know um, he's great at that. Well, and I think there's a, I mean, I think we got to it. I think we got to the point of that. And, and we've been discussing this too, is like national politics isn't actually, uh, it's, it's really just a spectator sport. It's not actually politics in, in right. the best sense of the word. This in the best sense of the word. Yeah, you, actually, you live in I, community. I can't watch pundits talk for very long because both sides are, in my opinion, the problem. Like well, you're, yeah, because they're putting on a show. They're yes. putting on a show. Like this right. whole like schism in the Republican Party. Well, there's no schism in the Republican Party. It's just it's just optics, just a story, Correct. just to keep keep the heat on, keep some press, get keep right. them in the news. Trump was yeah. great at that, right? I mean, yeah, he he would be on the front page every day. He'd come right. up with something, you know. And and that's but that's not actually affecting the life of people. No, uh, generally speaking, you know, day to day. Well, and the pundits are making money. 
and they're comfortable. That's the thing. E even if tomorrow, you know, by controlling soldiers, the narrative, right? Right. Even no. if soldiers marched down Main Street with tanks and, and everything, and in every town in America, and just like martial law, authoritarian dictatorship, this is the way it's going to be for the rest of your lives. Both sides of the political aisle, the pundits, would still have a TV show. Yeah. Because well, it's all, all bread, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. There's always going to be people sitting at the gate talking about what the right. people are doing inside. Right. It's like in the church. In the church, you always have pundits, but the pundits in the church are people that complain about other people's theology. <laughs> you don't know anything about that, do you? Personally? No, no, I'm not. From, I'm just like drawing from <laughs> the, the ether. Just well, and and, and, and channel. to your point, it's true. It's like you could just like talk to the person because, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you're reachable. You know, your information more can be found lot, on the internet. Yeah. I'm a yeah. little bit more than public. Yeah. yeah. So if you, I mean, if you're like, I don't really understand what you're teaching, or I think what you're mm -hmm. teaching is even harmful or hurtful. You're right. Um, to call, I call you up, send you an email. Well, if yeah. you send. I don't know. Don't send Riley an email. He's no, that's never going to happen, dude. But, like, but call you up. Scott you reads know. two sentences. I read the header. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you just kind of see how long, similarly, how long is it? It's too long. Uh, I'm not even going to bother. See, Gillespie knows me too well. If it's longer than two paragraphs, it immediately gets deleted. Like it's good. one sentence and a link is about about as much as you'll. It's like you'll greetings manage. in Christ, and I start. To, I'm like, these are long paragraphs. <laughs> send me a letter and right, that done. I can also recycle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. But it is interesting because uh, uh, you got to have a framework, though, to deal with local, you know, that local polis, that people, that people well, right. dynamic. That, there was a time in this country not so long ago when you were taught in civics class that part of being a good citizen was reading the newspaper every day and staying informed about current events. Now, when I used to read the newspaper back in the day... The newspaper that I read, the local newspaper, and even the regional newspaper, mm -hmm. was very much, here's what happened. Yeah. And well, it was independent, too. It wasn't being yeah, controlled it at was. a national level. I mean, level. there was bias, yeah. obviously. Every, I mean, nobody's not biased. But when you read the article, it was this person, this age, in this place, this happened. Mm -hmm. And then here's eyewitness testimony. Here's police you know, here's the police blotter. Here's what the judge said. Here's what this expert had to say about this thing. Actually kind of boring, really. Well, in fact, my dad used to be um, a, an independent contractor for the regional newspaper around elections times because he would go and then take notes on what happened at, you know, this politician showed up here who was running for county commissioner or county sheriff. And my dad would go and he would sit in on the meetings so he could take notes. And then he would write a short blurb for the newspaper Right. And then he get paid for that little, you know, 800 page, 600 page article on the local election for county sheriff. That used to be a thing. And now it's not so much anymore. And I think the point being then that as I was growing up and I was taught this by, um, I can't remember, Rudy. Rudy Pastika, I think was my civics teacher's name. Anyways, Fat Rudy, <laughs> we called him because he looked like the Death Star. Because when he would cinch his belt up, he looked like the Death Star. And so Rudy, tough old dude, but... <laughs> <laughs> like every day we had to come to class and we had to have our newspaper with us and we had to choose an article from the front page. We had to go through the article and then we had to write in two paragraphs, hmm. what's the article about, thesis, you know, all these different things, right? Right. And that was considered like to be a good citizen, you have to be informed. Whereas my opinion on pundits is we're so dumbed down as a society that we need pundits now to tell us this is how you're supposed to think about this. This is how you're supposed to feel about this. No, I think it's worse than that. I was walking right. through the grocery store mm -hmm. and uh, I was in the checkout aisle. I haven't done this in a long time, um, but we had to kill some time. We were between a wedding and a wedding ceremony, which is the stupidest schedule ever. Why do people do this? Where you're like three hours between the ceremony and the actual reception. I know they want to take pictures, but it's so mm -hmm. dumb. Anyway, so we're trying to kill some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm in the grocery store aisle and there's a few tabloids but the tabloids seem actually kind of tame compared to the stuff that I've read on the internet now. Right. Right. And and not, and then there's like there's like multiple like special editions of National Geographic like on whales and or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, and you. So what I realized is like Washington Post, New York Times, not to pick anybody in particular, but those two came to mind. Mm -hmm. Those they're really tabloids today. They're sensationalized. They, oh yeah, they, they're muckrakers. Yeah, they're not just yeah. telling telling the news, but they they apply a spin to it every right. time. What is, uh, a strong Claire spin. Lewis called it yellow journalism, muckraking. Right. And yeah. this is you know this is the the paper of record. This is democracy dies in dark, darkness. Right. Yeah. You know, and you're like, wait a minute, these people are 
not only are they partisan, and maybe partisan, I don't know. They're propaganda. But but yes, because they'll they'll always they'll add those those little key words like um you know, that are judgment, words of judgment. Yep. Like saying, um, you know, this was a lie or this was a fraud or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, wait a minute, this hasn't actually been adjudicated in anything but the court of public opinion, if even right. that. You've already adjudicated it and you want Correct. you want to be the judge over um, you know, the intent or, or the mm -hmm. actions that happened, rather than just simply, like you said, do the boring thing of just report it. Yeah. Just give us the raw data. Try to try to remain as neutral as you can right. be, which I mean you're always gonna have an opinion. Mm -hmm. But try to and then keep the op ed separate. Right. But that's what's flipped, I suppose, is that the op ed is, is and it's not even just opinion. Right. Editorial. Well, opinion. this is why Project Veritas has yet to lose a case in court. Well, for defamation, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're going up to New York Times now for this very point. And that's what you brought up to jar that memory is mm -hmm. right. they're basically like this wasn't in the opinion section of the newspaper. It was on the front page in the journalism section of the paper. And therefore, people reading your newspaper assume that what you're writing is true and not right. an opinion piece. Where they defamed um, Project Veritas yeah. right. as a as a right wing something something I something something. But uh, I think, it, and I, this is just thinking out loud. Is I think this is where not only um, outrage culture comes from, but cancel culture comes out of two sides sitting there screaming at each other, yelling mm -hmm. at each other, telling you. If you're not upset about this, if you don't feel this way about this, then you're not a real American or you're not for social justice or you're anti this or pro that. Right. And then like with Israel and Palestine now, people online, it's like, I'm staying out of that because one, my opinion doesn't change anything that happens. And two, I don't know enough about that conflict, nor do I want to know about that conflict to the point where I can post all day long every day about cool. that. Well, when you had that epic troll by the Israeli Defense Force, yeah, where That's where they nuts. used the Western press to actually end up annihilating yeah. <laughs> quite a lot of Hamas that were in the yeah. tunnels, right? You know, I mean, it was like, and so I've I've been following some of the IDF uh, Twitter the mm -hmm. Twitter feed, and it's it's hundred yeah. percent media media propaganda. It's really, yeah. I'm going to say slick. I mean, it's clever. Yeah. I mean, they they are spinning public opinion. They yeah. know that ultimately what how people feel about Israel is going to be judged not in the court. It's not going to no. be judged in international courts. Right. It's not going to be judged by politicians. It's going to be judged by people. <clears throat> right. And what they need to control people's opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That the mob is actually and always the power base in any society. <laughs> and any Wow, that sounds negative. But it's true. Yeah. Any leader who has recognized and accepted this has always worked to weaponize the mob. What's, what's being, Roosevelt? Carry a big stick? Wasn't that what it was? Oh, yeah. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Right. Is that in the present tense, it's the same thing. You saw this last summer with the mob of certain people who would walk up to people in, in outdoor cafes and demand that they apologize for their the color of their skin or apologize um, or chant their, you know, this the group's mantra. Mm hmm participate in the riots whatever but isn't like every political revolution a, a mob rev, mob based revolution yes that's what my point is that it's yeah. it's politicians weaponizing the mob by way of the media by the way and whether the, the cause is just or not isn't even the point no it here. doesn't matter because that's not the point justice isn't the point it's power mm -hmm. and maintaining power and if you can get gillespie and i to attack each other even though we're neighbors we won't turn around and realize oh it's actually the queen who's our real problem here well, that's like, what is, somebody was asking me. Well, like, actually, a lot of people keep asking me, especially at church. Like, I can't understand what's going on in this world. I'm like, that's the whole point. Exactly. You put put spin the world into a chaos. Do right. it as rapidly as possible before you have a chance to actually think about right. like what just happened to it. What right. Happened to us. Right. Don't sit back. Don't think. Act mm -hmm. act rashly. You know, mm -hmm. um, quickly. And it doesn't even have to like have any creative purpose. Actually, it right. needs to be destructive. So then yeah. people are like, oh no, who's going to save us from this body of death? You know, yeah. not sin, but <laughs> rather the chaos that, the, that we've created. Right. Like, and then they can swoop in and be like, yeah. where are your saviors? It's pretty much been agreed upon since the mid 1800s that human beings were made to live in groups of no more than like 50 to 100 people. Seems about right. Yeah. And to do essentially the same thing every day. <laughs> like we, we are made to hunt and gather, you know, protect the village, fish plant, crops, whatever it might be. Very limited, actually. A very limited number of things that we're actually made to do. But we're we're made to live in small groups and to live basically a, sus a sustenance lifestyle. It's kind of like a baby, except with more work. Yeah. 
<laughs> Pretty much. And <laughs> you look at the way right? that, yeah. you know, going back to what we saw, talked about with Scott there about social media. Yeah. yeah. We're not, our brain is not designed to function receiving that much just raw data. That's why we turn to people like, can you please explain the raw data? Because my brain can't comprehend all this. Well, I would say it's bigger than that. I mean, remember growing up and it was, um, you know, don't you care about the kids in Africa? You know? Yep. And it was like, baby. Um, well, it's not that I don't care about them. It's literally that I have almost no influence on them, right? Well, I'll be blunt as a, as a, as a hammer here. I didn't. I don't care about them. I don't know them. No, if I didn't want to eat the Brussels sprouts, I was told I'm supposed to care about I'm not going to eat the Brussels sprouts. I mean, Correct. I don't care if, whether they starve because I didn't eat right. my food. And isn't anyway. that a little manipulative? <laughs> Just like, slightly. You know, it's like every time you lie, you, you make the baby Jesus cry or an angel gets its wings torn off or something like that. It's like, it's right, the same basic principle. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, uh, well, it's globalist, right? It's a globalist yeah, kind of globalist, thing. It's like, yep. you, you have to care about everybody and you, right. you literally cannot. This is why God makes individual unique people. Correct. I mean, the scripture even confesses this. That right. It's a body with many members and each member right. has a unique, unique right. gift. Right. Right. And, and so it's not my job to do your job. It's not mm-hmm. your job to do my job. Yep. Right. Let's let's. But they're they're actually meant to complement each other. That's why God makes us the way He does. Mm-hmm. How that's going to work out? I mean, we kind of play with it. And we can see where it goes. Right. And we don't necessarily know what like what each of our individual congregations are going to look like. I mean, they're going to be probably look a little different. Right. Just because we have different people, and well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, humanism gives birth to globalism, and the humanist experiment is well, we got to love everybody the same. Everybody's equal. We got to love everybody. Well, everybody has to be the same, and everybody has to be the same eventually. A qual- um, not just is, equality, but a, right. uh, equity, right, is right. the word. Yeah, it's Marx and Freud and yeah. Yeah, we've heard this down. before. Yeah. Mm. But where it comes into the church then is, and I brought this example up in the All past. All sin is equal, maybe? No, is, well, what about the people in the Amazon rainforest that have never heard the gospel? The assumption being that if you're not there preaching the gospel or you don't know about what's happening in the Amazon rainforest, no one's preaching the gospel to those tribal members in that in that particular place, deep in the Amazon rainforest. Which is a pretty weak confession of the Holy Spirit in one, one Super sense. weak. Not only like, a super weak confession of the Holy Spirit, but the assumption, again, is that God's just impotent. Without you... <laughs> it's not going to happen. I don't know how we're going to do this. Yeah, right. But, and and until, you know, very recently, I myself didn't really know where that philosophy came from or that worldview came from. And now that I know, I'm like, oh, that's super insidious. Because to your point, I can love you because you're right in front of me, we spend a certain amount of time together, we're in certain proximity to each other. But if I'm not in relation to you, like literally in a relationship with you, it's impossible for me to love you the same as the people that I'm in most immediate contact with most days. Mm -hmm, My family, my congregation, to your point. And yet we're expected to love everybody the same because everybody's equal. It's like, no, they're not. They're just not intellectually, not horizontally, physically. right? Not, no, yeah, not in relation to each other. In relation to mm-hmm. God, 100%. I preached on this yesterday. Yep. In baptism, Galatians, we are all the same. We're a unity in Christ. But outside of Christ, we are not. And well, that's even, actually good. Even in Christ, um, but r- regards to our humanity, regards yeah. to our, our creatureliness. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and again, my point was that it's complementary, right? Correct. And that, and that we can actually support each other, but to do it in... To say, well, you know, putting people into like big buckets, like mm-hmm. political parties and saying, you know, and even saying that we need a two-party system, which both parties right. ironically say we need each other, even though they give the appearance of hating each other. It's kind of a, what do you call that? Collusion, I think? Yeah. Collusion. C-O-L-L. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we hate each other, but we know that we can't exist without the other. It's good. Bipartisanship is good. And I'm like, you keep saying that. Do you actually, right. oh, you want us to believe that, mm-hmm. that we couldn't possibly operate like right. in a three-party state right it's like under what like is because we're only binary people black mm-hmm. or white good yeah. good and evil is that is that why that works I'd... look at the way that we treat sports for example mm. to your point let's say football you have two football teams two basketball teams whatever it might be no it is binary yeah. on the field two sides you like kill the other guy you know do any do whatever you have to do to win and then you see them in the off season and they're on a fishing boat together because their family's vacation together because they're best friends you're like, well, wait a minute. I thought you guys hated each other. On the field, we do because we're trying to win. But off the field, we're best friends. Okay. Versus with fighters, you don't necessarily see that all the time. <laughs> but everybody, but the thing is... You, you know, don't see it with churches. You don't see it with... That's what I'm the, saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't see it in politics. No. Church, well, churches are very um, defensive because we're always afraid that we're going to lose members to some uh, to the other team. Like, yeah, it's largely an economic defense. Because basically, we got to have a whole bunch of free agents in church on Sunday. 
you know, back to what we're talking about, Scott, about is like most largely people coming to church. Largely uncommitted, yes. <laughs> largely uncommitted. I'm, you know, I'm just waiting for the better offer. Everybody in church, for the most part, thinks that they have free will and that they're sovereign individuals and that if they don't like this church, they'll just go find one that they do like and that that's their choice. Yeah, and the only time that that actually becomes difficult is if um, there's other strong connections there in that yeah. parish, right? Family right. or something mm -hmm. like that. Or, or I just, wonder, I mean, or if you're just lazy, mm -hmm. you know, well, that too. Yeah. changes requires some death and some right. you know, discomfort. Right. Well, my church has the best free trade coffee. That's why I stay. Mm, yeah. <laughs> or my church has the best coffee period. Sunday school so. program or how many, that hasn't really come up very much in the past year and a half, but it used to all the time. You and I would get that all the time. People would come and say, what kind of programs do you have? What kind of ministries do you guys do at your church? I still get that language from people. Do We're you? gonna get the programs going again. I'm like, Interesting. Really? Well, Maybe yeah, the old programs do that. Yeah, yeah, programming. I'm like, what? But new people coming in don't ask me those questions anymore. No, because they don't. They don't join. They're not right. joiners. And if they do join, it's all short term. It's one time, one time out. You know, right. we'll do it this one time. We'll right. see how it goes. That kind of thing, which is fine. Well, I don't know if you've done this, but the thing that has been encouraging to new members, and it came up at the voters meeting yesterday, actually, is. Um, my council has now accepted the differentiation between a voting member and a communicant member. Mm. And therefore, anybody who comes to my church, who's regularly attending my church, who I am their pastor, and is communing at our altar, is a member of our church. Big C. Sure. Yeah, You're a member of, of the church. Yeah. And then I tell them, if you want to sign the roster and you want to become a voting member and serve on council, that's cool. That's your choice. But it's not necessary to be a member here. I've been pushing towards that direction and saying, I mean, even thinking of... I don't know if there's, if we'd had some kind of rite or ritual that would lead into that. I mean, I almost, you know, I don't want people serving in leadership that doesn't, that don't say no to the Augsburg Confession because it's yeah. our theological constitution. Yeah, right. It's like, but how many, how many even know the small catechism? Right. <laughs> so like, right. right. So I mean, we, we've set this, like we were talking about with Scott, we set the standards so low that the people mm -hmm. who serve in leadership are sometimes, you know, the zealot, the new member yep. that mm -hmm. are, um, you know, the ones who could potentially even be dest destroyed by the lack of, of love that they, that they witness in these 100%. kind of settings, yeah. right? And I think the reason for that is that we don't come into it, you know, equipped with, uh, well, if you want to talk about, you know, church politics, it's still two kingdoms, right? You're mm -hmm. talking about, you're talking about sinful yeah. human beings interacting, right. you know, at trying to be saints mm -hmm. and the two <laughs> ne'er shall meet. <laughs> so yesterday I get the agenda and... God bless my church council president because he's on the same page with me and he has been since the day I walked through the door. Nice. He's one of the few people that are actually left from when I walked through the door. And I don't attend council meetings because I teach confirmation at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't attend them. And I wasn't attending them before I taught confirmation because I'm the pastor. I'm responsible for worship, not business. And I don't need veto power. You're adults. It's your church. Make up your own minds. Um, but I noticed that on the agenda, there was no pastor's report. And for almost a, like just the briefest of moments, my ego is like, hey, wait a minute. Well, I'll just wait till the end under new business and then I'll just spew all the pastor stuff. And then I checked myself. I was like, wait a minute, dude, you've been working towards this day for 13 years. <laughs> yeah. Don't blow it. And what happened, of course, is I didn't. I let everything go because this is a business meeting, not a pastoral worship meeting. And then everything that was said at the meeting, I said to the elders afterwards, hey, let's have a meeting on Friday to discuss the stuff at the meeting that pertains to the worship and the ministry of the church. Mm -hmm. And then I went and talked to the trustees as they were leaving. And I said, Hey, here's some things that um, you didn't address that I think are important that you should address. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll, I'll give you guys a couple of weeks and then we'll come back and talk about it again. Right. But recognizing pastorally, at least, and again, this is very old school way of understanding this. My job essentially starts at the nave and works its way up to the altar. Mm -hmm. Like I'm responsible for the worship and ministry of this church business is not actually what I was called to do. I'm not an office administrator. And you, but that you, thing of, over your shoulder suggests maybe otherwise. Well, it says that no, it's very definitive actually what it says. Right? Not the diploma of vocation. I'm thinking about the supplement to the diploma of vocation. Have you seen the supplement? No, I haven't. That's why it's not on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> the supplement does say this. See again, they, they had to write a supplement. If you have to write a supplement, yeah, okay. That's what I'm saying. Is again, as you and I both say, Christianity's simple. It's us who make it complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Ministry is super simple. Ministry. You have one job. No matter where <laughs> you're standing in the world, right, you have one right, job. Right. Just do that job and get out of your way. Yep. Your sins are forgiven. In fact, you know, I've been quoting you nonstop the past week or so because uh -oh. you said, right. And I think you said on the podcast last time too of 
If I'm wrong, praise God. Oh, yeah. And if I'm right, Lord, have mercy. That was two weeks ago. And two we weeks repeated ago. repeated it last week, yeah. And I've been repeating that over and over to people, too, because the preach, you know, the quote-unquote political preaching, two kingdoms mm-hmm. preaching, law, mm-hmm. ac- actually, it's law gospel preaching. It's just they're so shocked that I'm being so specific about things. They're like, well, wait a minute, that's not the law. I'm like... Yeah, you're doing like a John the Baptist before Herod law preaching, which is... Yeah. yeah. Again, every Saturday night, baby, they're going to fire me for this one. But then when we walk out and we go into the room and we sit down to have that voters meeting, this is business. This is where you as members of this church, this is your church. You paid for it, you bought it. So if you break it, that's on you, not me. Or you were given it. I or mean, you were given it, sure. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it might be. Or you walked in, again, you walked in as new members and you want to be a part of this. You want to serve on council. You want to serve in the ministries of the church. Awesome. However, just so you know, there's a personality here. There's a way that we do things. Um, and how you then interface with the folks that are already doing it, that's on right. you. You're an adult. Think for yourself. Right. right. Well, and, and, it's real, not, it, and there's no prescription there. No. There is a prescription as to um, the institutions of the church, rightly spoken, yeah. right? So baptism, yeah. Lord's Supper, et cetera. Yeah. There are prescriptions attached Absolutely. to these. Like, you know, forgive sins by actually saying these words, right? Right. Like, forgive right. your sins in the name of Jesus. Right. right. Whereas um, something like the governance of the congregation, it's like, no, you're, no, you're right. free. I mean, you're not free to, to neglect it. Correct. But you are free how you're going to be responsible for this, right. you know? Uh, whether you're going to have a council or whether you're going to have a board of deacons or something, mm-hmm. or or you're going to just do voters assemblies. Which... I don't recall ever preaching the gospel in a voters meeting. Well, or why would you it. unless there was unless there was sin? Correct. Being... Well, I have done that before. It's been about 12, uh, 11 years since I had to shut down a meeting and restart it. <laughs> because it, right. that's, that's Peeper's Dogmatics, by the way, volume three. Um, which we've never read on this podcast. No, we haven't read Peeper. Peeper's Dogmatics, the green books, as they're called. For those who are non-LCMS, non-Lutherans, Franz Peeper is the dogmatician for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Always was, always is, always will be. People but he's really, tried to, yeah. as far as dogmaticians go, he's still JV. Yeah, he really is. But I <laughs> like him for that. I like him for that. No, it's derivative. He, I mean, he gets rid of a lot of the chaff from like buyers. He uh, does. Dogmatics, and which is like His footnotes are full of Luther quotes from Galatians and Romans yeah, right. and other exactly. things. Yeah, it's good. But in volume three on the Holy Spirit, and he, he gets to Christian life and vocation and stuff like that. And he's got a whole book of essays that I have on this topic. And it's invaluable because he's pre-World War II, pre, right. I don't care about your democracy <laughs> kind of attitude. Because, you know, he's, he's still Isn't German. He's second generation. Yes. He was the, se- he was the second LCMS president. And he served yes. as... Uh, was he second? Really? I think he was the second after Walter. Dang. Or maybe he was the third. But he, uh, and his brother mm. was a Wisconsin Senate guy. He came out of the Wisconsin Senate. Mm, okay. There we go. Nice. <clears throat> anyway. But the point is, he says that, and I learned it from Peeper when he says, when the voters are behaving in an unchristian manner, it behooves the pastor to stop the meeting, remind them of their Christian vocations and their Christian faith, say a prayer of repentance, and then restart the meeting. So mm. I did that at a meeting. Um, it did not go over well <laughs> with certain no. people at the meeting who were behaving in an unchristian and childish Well, because they way. don't actually think the gospel applies to their Correct. life together in, yeah. what What do you want to say? In politics, I guess, in Correct. church politics, mm-hmm. right? How you govern mm-hmm. yourself as a congregation. Right. Like, if the gospel doesn't apply here, then it doesn't apply in your marriage then, it doesn't apply yeah. in your civic vocation. That's such a great point, because this, yeah. again, came up yesterday, is the whole reason we want to be ruled is so we don't have to take responsibility for our choices. We don't mm-hmm. want to accept consequences for our bad choices in particular. Mm-hmm, right. And so you come to church, just like you said, in your marriage, in your house, in your community, if someone comes along and offers to take away your um, autonomy, right. as long as you do it in a kind way that makes them feel good about themselves, <laughs> they're more than happy to give away their free will to you and sure. give away their autonomy and let you rule over them. <clears throat> but it, when you remind them that they don't have autonomy, they really get upset. Because it, it's, yeah. all, it's all theater. Yeah. It's just this back and forth. You read from the script and I'll read my part from the script and we'll all pretend that we're all in this together and we all have free choice. Well, and I think I think the way that spins out is that you end up with, um, ultimately, the congregation that they kind of get to, a, what do you want to say, an equilibrium where things are, you know, everybody is at least content with the way things right. are, but there's mm-hmm. no growth. It ends yeah. up stagnating because any kind of growth is going to require um, discipline, correction, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, some hard choices. You're gonna have to maybe some repentance. You're gonna have to walk back. <laughs> exactly. You're gonna walk yeah. your stuff back. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and none of that is pleasant. Um, Correct. 
it's all beneficial, but it's, it's, well, it doesn't it's need not to be. I, I said something after church two weeks ago to somebody, and it was after church, and that's what I let off with during the meeting is, now you remember, I told you repeatedly, don't ask me questions after church. I'm not good after church with questions. I seek the, I seek this, the simplest answer, which is usually no. <clears throat> and then I get home, and I have a nap, and I get some <clears throat> calories back in me, and my brain starts to get oxygen returned to it. I'm like, yeah, that wasn't the best answer. So we had a meeting and I'm like, you know, I thought about it and I think this is how we can work this out. And I think to benefit you and also I'm not going to compromise, don't, I don't have to compromise. Um, and it was great because I just acknowledged, I'm like, I told you I'm not really good after church with big questions, um, but I apologize. That's why I reached out to you and I want mm -hmm. to make it right. And I think this is the way to do it. And through that conversation, I think at least from my side of the street, like a relationship that was tangential before that meeting is now again like they're one of my biggest supporters mm -hmm. because I just took the time as the pastor to sit down and say, Hey, you know what? I misspoke. I made a mistake. I was short with you. You didn't deserve that. I've thought about it now. And I think actually we can do this. We can work this out. I think this is how this right. will work. Right. And for the pastor not to just be like, no, go away. <laughs> and that's it. That's the end of the conversation. Well, you know what that does to a person. They're right. going to shut down. Right. Versus like, no, I want you to come and I want you to flourish. So like, where, where did we go off the path here in this conversation? And is it, is it something that we can fix and repair? Or is it something that I can't agree with you on? Or I don't, you know, whatever the, the, the dynamics might be. <clears throat> but we're always so quick to dig our heels in and stand our ground and say, well, no, no matter what, because I'm the pastor or because I think I'm right. I just talked to my nine-year-old about this this morning. So the fact that if I at 49, I'm acting like a nine-year-old, there's definitely something wrong with me. Yeah. Well, and isn't it interesting that those kind of um, criticisms, usually, mm -hmm. uh, which may even be uh, right and true and good, but they're, if they're not given in the right context, right, right um, that you take offense to it. I mean, especially like after, you know, a long divine service mm -hmm. um, that you're emotionally invested in, you know, to have somebody give you a critic level of criticism right after church. Right. Not good. It's not good because you you don't have any emotional distance from what just happened. Right. Um, and you're not going to receive it well. It would be, yep. I mean, it doesn't just pastors either. I mean, I suppose it could be like the church musician. You say the organist, mm -hmm. I didn't really like that hymn that you, I didn't like how you played the hymn. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I mean, that's devastating. Yeah. And there's no way around it, even if it's just like, you, it, whether, it, especially if it's unfounded, but even if it's found, well, well founded. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had somebody get like an anonymous note, right? And we're not, anonymous notes are stupid. Don't yeah. do it. Don't, don't do, do it with, yeah. you know, even if you're going to write like, it doesn't matter if you're going to write your senator, I don't care. Don't mm -hmm. you sign your name to it. If you right. can't sign your name to it, write it out if you want to and then throw it away. Yeah. Right. Get it off your get it off your chest. That's fine. Yeah. Or pray about it. Even better. But um but uh anyway, you get an anonymous note and we don't respond to them. We throw them out, you know. Um mm -hmm. but you can't help but notice you have to read it to find out that it's anonymous and then mm -hmm. and then it gets right into your conscience. And even though which is exactly the intent, right? Yeah. They don't actually want you to respond or they would put their name on it. They Correct. want you just to, they just want to burden your conscience with it. Right. It's a dart. Uh, it is a, it is a most dart. Days. Right. Yeah. Right. Most days it's just a dart. Right. And it, just how, hmm, I mean, how, I guess we're sensitive to that because we take it, well, if you take your job seriously, right, you're going to be sensitive to it. I would say that I've spent the better part of a decade working my way out of being sensitive about it. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't think, take it personally. <clears throat> it's not a personal attack. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you have to recognize that that's the point. You have to recognize that they're not attacking you. Mm -hmm. They're attacking what you represent. Or they're attacking something else and you're just the uh, stand-in for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're a proxy. Yeah, you're a mm -hmm. proxy target. You're a total. There's, some, there's something else going on and, and right. you're the closest person, so you get it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Or you're the yeah. most willing to receive it. I mean, that sure. may be it too. Well, we both had people come to church from other churches who, when they come, they're like, you're just like all the other pastors. You can't <laughs> fool me. I know you. It's only a matter of time before you play your cards. And you're like, okay. It might be true, actually. Actually, it might be true. I may be a used car salesman. But there's nothing you can do about it because you mm -hmm. recognize, again, you represent something to them. You're a proxy for that guy or that person versus like, well, here's what, like, here's what I can do. Like you said, I can, I can do my job with integrity. I can strive to be humble. I can try and live in the forgiveness that I've received and then extend that same mercy to you. Right. So long as you want to receive it and are willing to receive it. <clears throat> but it's like in the small call articles, the mutual consolation and conversation of the saints. 
that's the fourth gospel for Luther, like the fourth way the gospel gets preached. Mutual kind, yeah. or as my professor said, it's two people sitting at the ta table having coffee, absolving each other of their sins. Mm -hmm. like, that's how it happens. And for me as a pastor, we've talked about this in the past, like you don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't schedule a time for pastoral care or private confession. <clears throat> because when you do it formally, no one wants to partake, or at least very few people want to partake of it. But well, they have a like, hard enough time dragging themselves out to right. get to church formally. Exactly. Versus like, hey, you want to talk? Actually, yeah, I do. When do you have time? You t you shoot some dates and times at me and I'll tell you. I'll, I'll pick one. I'll make time for you. Again, like I've talked about, don't say I don't have time or I'll check my schedule. You say either it's a priority or it's not a priority. Right. And they'll communicate to you that it's actually um, right. a priority for them, but in a backhanded kind of way, right? And right. they'll say, well, you're. I know you're really busy. Mm-hmm. It's like saying you don't have time for me. And it's like, Correct. well, that's not actually true. It's, true. One, it's my job. And two, right. why wouldn't I have time for you? Right. I mean, in fact, I do have time because everybody who says that to me leaves me alone so that I have nothing but time because <laughs> everyone thinks I don't have time. It's like, because we, uh, I addressed this yesterday afternoon too, is <clears throat> this is the pastoral debrief, by the way. I'm not recording this on, on Dropbox or on Hijack. Is my congregation's tripled in size since January. And therefore I have tripled the number of people who are interfacing with me mm -hmm. in a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So a little bird chirped in my elder's ear about visitations and commuting shut-ins. And, and one of the people told me five years ago, don't visit me. I don't want this. Then my elder went and said, Hey, and the person said, I don't want to be communed. I don't want to be visited by the pastor. I don't want this. <clears throat> and yet five years later, they're still chirping in my elder's ear. Why doesn't he do this? Well, what you don't know is I've had this conversation already. Right. And, and you, you can only to, have it so many times and then you just have to let it, let well, it lie. Well, that too. But like when a person says, no, don't come, that's what they mean. Don't come. Um, but second of all. Is it? Is it always? <clears throat> well, in the upper Midwest, it's actually, I need you to come. No, 100%. In the upper yeah, right, Midwest, right. it's absolutely, you need to come. Yeah. I learned that my first month in ministry. <laughs> <laughs> um, like she said, she didn't want me to visit. That means she wants you to visit. I'm like, I, What? Then just tell me you want me to visit. Well, she's yeah, never going to do that. A little honesty would help, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But what that one person doesn't recognize because that person is communicating with three other people and it's a group of four. And that's all they do is talk to each other. <clears throat> Inside, outside of church. But they're not aware of all the other people that are having conversations and text threads with me and coming in for meetings during the week or I'm going mm -hmm. to visit. Mm -hmm. They only see their pod and the fact that I'm not engaged in their pod. But it's like, well, one, you didn't include me. Two, you didn't talk to me or communicate with me about it. And three, when you came back to church after being gone for a year, right. did you not notice that there were 80 people in church that weren't here last February? Like, I, again, eight people is one thing, but 80, like when you come in and you have to walk all the way to the front of the church to sit down in the front pew because there's nowhere else to sit. No, I think they did, probably did. I think they probably did recognize <clears throat> it. And that's part of the reason why they were upset. Is they recognize oh, things have oh, changed. Oh, for sure. That's a part of it. Yeah. That that complaint has reached me. Like, I don't know who these people are. <clears throat> well, Correct. that's and not my fault. My that's your fault, actually. Correct. Yeah, and they're in my yeah. seat. <laughs> you forfeited your seat. <laughs> they're, they're sitting next to each other, and they haven't covered their faces. I went to, I went to a wedding on Saturday, and it was, uh, was kind of strange. Because right. uh, there was, like, two families that had that were did fit, cover their face, and nobody mm -hmm. else did. And we were all packed together, and it was like... yeah. And there was not a peep about it. I was like, yeah. like, did we, well, I mean, here we haven't really had a mask, mandatory mask mandate mm -hmm. since last May, but, but still it was like, you realize that's supposed to be normal. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then things have changed. But if, if mm -hmm. you haven't been participating in that, I imagine there were people there that are like, wait a minute, nobody's doing it. Right. We have it in our purse, but nobody's doing it. I guess we won't right. do it. Like, that too. It's just like, but like we were texting about, if you don't come to church for a month, just four Sundays, let alone 12 months, mm -hmm, right. <clears throat> excuse me, but you don't come to church for four Sundays in a row and you walk in, you're walking into a conversation that's been going on for four hours. Right. In that sense. Or at least, yeah. At yeah. least four hours. And you walk into a room and these people have been visiting for four hours and you're like, hey, what are you talking about? Depending on when you walk in and what part of the conversation you hear, that's insane. Like you hear insanity. <laughs> because you're coming in the middle of something that you have no context for. And then you, you leave that, and you're like, well, I'm angry because I didn't like the conversation. Do you think that's why people, some people intentionally do the like once a month thing? 
is so that they're not actively part of the conversation. They don't have to be committed to it. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Based on my experience. Yes. I, I've, I wondered about it because it's, because they don't, some of them will complain about not knowing what's going on, but generally mm -hmm. not. <clears throat> the ones who mm -hmm. complain about what's not going on are the people who, um, you know, don't have that kind of, I, I can't even get my head around, like, how would you have the discipline to come once a month? I've never yeah, for, understood. I the, can't. I couldn't do it honestly. It's like either you come every week or you don't come at all. That's ba that's basically well, uh, at least that's me regularly. <laughs> I don't even know what regularly is. If I miss, well, I miss. for me, regularly would be every week. But I'm just saying, if there's a week where you're out of town or you're traveling or you're, oh you know, right, 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 or right, something no. happened where your kids are sick, right? So but then that, that church, week you're but, like something's weird today, right? Right. It's not right. right. Yeah. Something's not right today. Right. But yeah, to to come in mid conversation, so to speak. So to, we had this meeting this past Friday, my elders' meeting. Um, one elder was off for three weeks vacationing with his family. But they were sick for a week. They missed a whole month. So we're talking about the sermon. And it was the one on the camel, the lion, and the baby. It was very uh, allegorical, obviously, um, analogical. My elder, the one elder who's here every Sunday, knew every phrase where I was referring to something else. Mm, right. He's like, you said this in that clause, and I know when you say that word, you're referring to this. Mm -hmm, the other right. elder was like, I don't, what are you talking about? He was right, talking about a you're dragon. shorthand now. Right. Um, which right. is almost ends up being code language then for those who mm -hmm. haven't been listening. Right. Mm. Okay. Yeah, because you're like, um, the dragon's Satan. <laughs> well. and he's like, I kind of got that part, but what was up with the scales and the thou shalt and, and compliance? <laughs> I haven't I'm seen like, your sermon yet from, uh, from yesterday. Okay. Uh, so, yesterday was baptism. No, yesterday was a good one. Just okay. straight down the line baptism sermon. You know, I might have had a couple key phrases for the you know, for the regulars. But the point is then that Every pastor preaches a certain way. They have a certain cadence, a certain tone, a certain energy, but they also use certain key phrases mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are specific to them like any author does. And if you're there every Sunday or you're in Bible study regularly, you're a part of a conversation. Right. It's like confirmation. Like you and I have a conversation with our confirmands that's very specific to that context. And we can pick that conversation up at any point, anywhere in time. We can see them downtown at the, at the store, we mm -hmm. can see him at the park, we can see him at church, and we can immediately pick up the conversation from where we left off. Right. And they're participating in it because they're a part of it. But if they haven't been to confirmation in four weeks, and he, hey, man, where you been? Well, you know, X, Y, Z reasons. Like, we, we covered an entire section on baptism that you missed. So I'm going to give this stuff to your parents, and I'm going to have them talk through the material with you. Right. But that doesn't even matter, though, because you're not in the conversation with them, and they're missing everything that happens within the context of that conversation just like with church on Sundays and worship. Hmm. You're not communing together. You're not hearing the sermons. You're not singing the hymns together. You're not praying together. Yeah. Well, we were texting about, um, I think, you know, I, I was kind of reflecting upon the the way that the scriptures were intentionally uh, written to be heard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that it, that it isn't primarily uh, visual. Right. Uh, although, I mean, it's evocative in a visual way, imaginatively, mm -hmm. right? But, but not, but that's not how it was chosen to be transmitted, not in a picture book format, but actually Correct. with words and spoken. <laughs> and uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> You're just imagining that. Um, I am, and, yeah. but, I, but I think the brilliance of it is, because I was thinking in terms of propaganda and the way that uh, I was watching that Goddard um, documentary about, mm -hmm. you know, who's a uh, filmmaker and talking about how, how he could basically convince, it turned the documentary, this is 1970, but it turned, it's like, yeah, we can convince people to be Marxist through our films. Right. Because oh, it's very a, easily, yeah. Because it's not, it's not actually a, um, it's not a logic, well, it is a logical argument, but it is, a, it's primarily emotive and it, mm -hmm. it's more easily communicated um, through film than right. it is with words. Because we're, there's something about words and, and spoken word where you're like, um, it's, it's just, it's harder to deceive, I think, right? Um, but maybe not everybody. I mean, some people well, are visual. There's a learners. lot missed in translation when you're reading something or hearing something. Right. But even spoken, I mean, uh, I mentioned the USA Today and they're like mm -hmm. charting, right? Which is what they innovated on mm -hmm. um, is, is creating these manipulative charts, right? Right. Which deceived through data. Um, so it's just easier to deceive. Anyway, I was just thinking about your catechism thing. And, and it's like, mm -hmm. no, we're building a common language. Correct. Right, so that we understand each other. Right. That, that you, when you're preaching um, and, and you as a hearer are mm -hmm. listening, that, that you understand one another. And there is going to be right. code language. There's no mm -hmm. way around that because mm -hmm. you're, because you're, that's part of a, a tribe or a culture is that, right. is that you it's share. nomenclature, yeah. Yeah, you share, you share language. And yes, when somebody comes in, you're going to have to do the work to define, 
Yeah. And we get, we kind of, I don't know about you, I get blindsided sometimes. I forget that I haven't had this conversation with this person before. I just had that conversation about that conversation on Friday. Same thing, right? Because yeah. we literally have... I talked have... About, have we talked about this before? And they, they'll be like, I have mm-hmm. no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, well, right. I guess we haven't. So then it's like, it oh, again. I haven't explained communion in a while. Or I haven't explained the fact that we don't pass the offering plan anymore. And it doesn't have to do with COVID. I should probably explain that to people because they're a little confused. I've had nobody ask. Mm-hmm. Nobody has asked, are we going to start passing the plate again? Yeah. I'm like... I, I just, I see it as an artificial interruption of the divine service. Oh, for sure. I actually have people shaking hands instead, which is like, right. if you're going to do something collectively, 100%. rather than collect money, <laughs> yeah. how about yeah. you actually greet one another in the name of Jesus, yeah. right? And, you know, at least here, our offerings haven't dropped. Mars haven't. You know, again, again, this goes back to Peeper again. Peeper comes up twice in this stuff. Peeper has a whole thing on offerings. Does he? And, yeah. Oh. And oh, I should go use he goes that. from Old Testament 4 and he's like, well, in the Old Testament, it's the box at the back of the building and it's, you know, you have to put your money in. It's a law. In the it's New the Testament, in, Paul says it's not a law that, anymore. It's yeah. the freedom of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that moves you through love for your church to give an offering, which is, a, when you read it in context, it's hyper-manipulative because he's basically mm-hmm. saying, if you don't feel like giving your money, you don't have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> like, he kind of concludes on that. Like, Holy Spirit and love is what determines whether or not you're going to make an offering. So if you don't make an offering... Well, there is the whole bit about money kind of becoming a God, right? Mm-hmm. I don't believe that. I've never seen that happen, so I can't. <laughs> but I think everything done freely in the spirit, capital S spirit, but also just small S spirit, spirit of, of kindness and love and, and recognizing that, yeah, everybody who comes through that door is carrying a weight, carrying a cross. Mm. And it's not for me to hunt for that cross. It's not for me to try and understand your intent or your motive right. and, and figure you out like you're a problem. Like we talked about this in Bible study yesterday that people are not math problems, but the old Adam sinner treats everything like a problem because he's like God knowing good and evil, but he has no ability to control it. And so when we turn away from God, we devote our lives to solving the problem of other people, the problem of ourselves, the problems of the world, rather than like, no, you weren't put on earth to solve problems. Like Gillespie is not a math equation. You're a person with your own thoughts, your own moods, well, your own in, in the same way that salvation is not an equation, like equals exactly. Jesus or something. Right, right. Yeah. But we can't help ourselves. We turn everything into a problem. It's like, that's why we say it. You know, you know what problem, you know the problem that I have with that right now? It's like, oh, you have a problem with that. Or, hey, you know what the problem is here? It's like, why is everything problem solution? Yeah, problems even, lead to even solution. Our, exactly. Even our preaching is that way. Problem, law, solution, gospel. <laughs> Do you? I don't know if I do. I that. don't, but I'm just saying that you. I've heard it hundreds, if not thousands, of times at this point in my life. Problem, law. The law shows you the problem, and then the gospel comes along, and Jesus is, fixes it. Mm. He's the solution to the problem. Mm. The problem of sin, I suppose. Right. Or I death, guess I don't. Or know. the world, or something. We can't like help that. ourselves. You know, you have the judges, and then you have the kings, and then you have the prophets. And then is it Jesus. possible that you just can't actually fix it, and you're just going to have to die? Uh, yeah. Okay. I think that's kind of why he goes that direction with <laughs> salvation. It's, it's like, like, this is not repairable. Yeah, no. I can't break this and, and build it back better. You're going to be broken down into common parts. <laughs> like right. Which, by the way, as we, we haven't talked about this in a while, this is why the analogy of brokenness does not work for sin. Mm-hmm. I don't think because so. Because it's not biblical. I mean, we. And I it, think yeah. it, it's somewhat hopeful that like there can be some taste of heaven on earth apart from the divine service apart from christ and his forgiveness right like in in your marriage in your life i mean there, there's moments of i'd say things that we call beautiful yes i would argue from the jeremiah text yesterday jeremiah 17 text and i that isaiah and jeremiah in particular when they talk about the future look to the past this is a very mm. Israelite way of understanding time and history. Oh, I was thinking about that too on, on Sunday. And but so when Isaiah and Jeremiah describe the future, and in that text in, in chapter 17 of Jeremiah, he's talking about, you know, you're like a bush plant, um, planted in a, in a wilderness that's been blasted by sunlight. But the one who trusts in the Lord is like a tree planted beside water whose roots, you know, reach the water. And even in a drought, it doesn't worry because it still produces fruit. Mm-hmm. And I know there actually a historic antecedent for that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Genesis chapter two. Okay, there you go. Because all of the prophetic literature that points to the future is actually pointing to Genesis chapter two. So to your point, then, Mm -hmm. when I'm in my backyard, and 
you know, again, we're semi-rural, but as rural as you can get without being like down on the farm. Um, I'm in my backyard and I'm looking at the lawn, the grass, the dandelions. I'm looking at the trees. I'm looking at the tall grass along the creek. And I'm saying to myself, because there's no power lines intersecting my sight line. There's no planes overhead. There's nothing except like the earth. That's Genesis chapter two. Right. But I know it's not because I'm standing there thinking about it. Hmm. But that then that's the overlap of this is pointing you to the resurrection and the last day. Right. This is what it's going to look like without everything that you've cluttered up the earth with because of original sin. I was, I was, I mean, this is a really big tangent, but I, I was thinking about, um, I guess what we call the art of interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was listening to a conversation about Revelation, I think chapter eight. Anyway, he kept pointing back to the Old Testament, to the prophetic um, mm -hmm. voices like uh, Joel chapter two, which is quoted at Pentecost this coming Sunday, right? Yeah. And, um, but also then Ezekiel uh, 38, and I think, I don't remember the other text that came in. It was Zechariah something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how, you know, my, in my, I guess, what life as a aspiring theologian of some mm -hmm. sort, um, I, I've come to a greater understanding of seeing Jesus in the historic narratives of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But not yeah. as much in the prophetic writings, maybe a little bit like Isaiah 53, 52. Mm -hmm. That's pretty obvious. Um, but elsewhere... Um, and even in, in like the apocalypse and those apocalyptic writings, yeah, we're just, we didn't, they're not even part of our vocabulary and they're not part of our understanding Yep. And, and to such a way that we can even say like, what is the historic antecedent? Yeah. Uh, Cause they're, they're often prophetic, mm -hmm. but they, but like you're saying, they're pointing backwards, um, to say like, oh, I don't know, uh, with Joel, what is it? The moon will be turned to blood, right? Yeah. Is there another occasion of that? Or is it only the cross, which I, that's how Peter interprets it, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, uh, you know, the blood red moon, that whole yeah. thing. But, you know, it's, it's just that lack of, hmm, I guess it's just biblical knowledge ultimately, um, but also a willingness to see all time in history and, and even your own personal life as mm -hmm. being confessed in those texts. Yeah. You know, that, that when we see these patterns and structures or that Hebrew understanding of that cyclical nature of, of, yeah. of time, you know, I mean, we could talk about that just on a political level, right? With our what we're experiencing as a country is not mm -hmm. unique to us. This is not no. the first time this has happened. It's not going to be no. the last time, probably either, unless Christ comes. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we could learn from the past and how others have, you know, mm -hmm. rebuked the error and and, and called right. it back. Or some would argue that they never that you can't. It's just mm -hmm. it's fate complete. It's just how it's going to happen. Yeah, because it's happened three other times before. This is the you know, right or five or however many. Mm -hmm. I sent you that. Who was that theory? Somebody Strauss theory. Was it Cloud Levi Strauss or was it somebody else? No, some of the Strauss, but the, mm -hmm. that we're in what they call the fourth turning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and they, they've done this. This is a theory that started in the 90s. It's mm. a book. And, like, that, and they show history as being cyclical. And I think yeah. it's pretty compelling uh, without even the scriptures, right? Just, mm -hmm. you know, modern history since the right. Refor little, shortly before the Reformation, like 1300. Right. You just see one cycle, the same cycle and the same mm -hmm. four steps over and right. over and over. It's like, wait a minute, this might be written into like the very nature of, of creation and mankind is it's like four well, cycles when Adam fell all creation fell with him well there's the seasons too though and they're pretty well distinguished that too um, what know? is the theory do you remember what the theory is called oh i don't know see i brought it up and now we're talking about it i was gonna say you gotta look it up so you can hyperlink it fourth turning i got this from uh see i listen to political stuff too but i don't listen to the same ones as you and they talk about it all the time strauss what? how Strauss Howe generational theory. That's it. Yeah, and I, but I think it's compatible. I mean, William with Strauss. There we go. You see these archetypes and types. Well, I mean, that's mm -hmm. Carl Jung too, I suppose. Yeah, personality types. But you see it yep. historically as well in these cycles. And it's not the Jewish idea that there's only three cycles. It's like no, it's the same four cycle, same four part cycle over and yeah. over and over. There's different archetypes within those four four cycle, you know, four yeah uh, step cycles. But what do they call the archetype? Prophet, nomad, hero, and artist. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, I'll link to it. It's crazy stuff, man. You look at it and you're like, I think they might be onto something here. Right. You know, if history is cyclical, let's, let's look for the patterns. And then maybe you can be prepared to actually respond to them. Well, some, a few. Right. Not convinced. Can, can you imagine though, if we end up in a, I mean, this is all since the dark age, but we end up in a, mm -hmm. in a new dark age, you know, a thousand year, like basically you know, uh, what, what was that? What was the Dark Ages? It was a feudal society, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah, I was going to say, um, we're kind of there. 
at least where I'm at, we're moving towards a neo-feudalist society. Because hmm. Minnesota, in the upper Midwest, but in Minnesota in particular, which I'm most familiar with, 80 plus percent of the state voted red last year. Hmm. And despite the over 100,000 votes that went missing that no one investigated because apparently Minnesota never gets included with other states that do this stuff. Um, most people in local communities around here and up north um, in the state, they made up their mind last year what they were going to do and, and not do and accept and not accept socially. And it didn't matter whether the attorney general of the state of Minnesota threatened to sue them or did sue them or what the governor did or said about them in, in press conferences. Upper Midwestern people in general are just like, yeah, we're just going to go on with our life and ignore you if we don't I suppose agree that's with you. true. I suppose that's true. Which is frustrating if, you try, if you're trying to organize <laughs> and get people to, to act. Um, it's really difficult because they're like, eh, it'll be over eventually. So to your point, when I lived in Mexico, they have a term manana, meaning tomorrow. And they developed it over the course of being conquered by numerous European peoples. Spanish, Dutch, French, German, Spanish, so forth and right, so on. Right, manana. Right. So they're like, hey, are, well, you know, why aren't you guys re rebelling against the Germans? Eh, manana. Meaning, yeah, after they're gone, somebody else is going to conquer us, like the Aztecs did and the Incas. <laughs> so they have like this mentality of conquest. So therefore, they're like, well... If we've been like not occupied for the past 25 years, it's only a matter of time before we're invaded and occupied again because it always happens. Whereas in the United States, we don't really have that mentality because we're still a pretty young nation. And two, we haven't experienced being conquered by an external invading force like Mexico. But to your point then, I mm -hmm. see a lot of people in the upper Midwest now, politically speaking, they're like, eh, you know, he'll be voted out eventually and replaced with another guy who'll probably be as bad as him. Or not. Yeah, but that's a failure to see the uh, escalation of the conflict. I, I think so. Yeah, you know, at least, especially over the last 20 years. Um, and, but I would and, maybe yeah. even longer. Well, I don't know. And I, I, I ponder that a lot. I ruminate on a lot because in a sense... I don't think I it's see, all optics. I don't think it's all optics. I don't, I think that, but I, I see think people that have the happening. faith to trust in God like, yeah, it's going to be okay. I'm like, are you delusional or do you do have great faith? Well, in one sense it is. Before God, it'll be fine. Right. But but it is going to affect you and your children and your grandchildren. Right. And I think from my perspective, that's why I get so heated about it because I'm like, but this has to do with generations to right. come. Yeah. And ultimately then you're neglecting love of your neighbor. I think so. Yeah. Um, that's at least where I've landed thus far. Is I don't I think so. really think I mean, it's love for neighbor to ignore the problem or... Yeah, but it's not ignore. a battle that you have to win, but I do think mm -hmm. it's a battle you need to fight. Right. Make yeah. that distinction. You know, I, mm -hmm. I mean, you fight to win, of course. Right. Um, but if you if you don't win, at least you can say, I, I did something, mm -hmm. right? Um, for the sake yeah. of conscience, if anything. You say, look, we, we push back and... Well, that, and Paul does we, that, right? I fought the fight. I ran the race. Oh, that's true. He does. Like he even makes that admission. Like I didn't yeah. just sit around and let people come to me like I'm a philosopher on, sitting on a big rock somewhere. Right. It's like right. I fought the fight. Well, and th there is, again, if you want to use the pattern of uh, the scriptures, at least there, mm -hmm. you know, we've been going through Saul or, um, you know, the kings. You can do this with yeah. the judges. Right. It's like, if the Lord doesn't give you victory, he doesn't give you victory. But that doesn't right. mean you don't fight the battle. Right. You know. Well, to use an analogy on that point, I think, well, one, I don't think most people want to fight well, for anything. Well, they don't want to fight think, for their marriage. They don't want to fight for their kids. They don't want to fight for their job. They don't want to fight for their community. Right, but I don't know that themselves. they know who they're fighting against or what they're fighting against. Right, because be I've like part of it. I've I've queried people and said, do you know what critical race theory is? They don't mm -hmm. know. But like you pointed yeah. out to me, if you start to outline some of the tenets, and they're like, right. oh, that thing. Yeah, yeah. no. Right. Oh, I get it now. Right. Yeah. Um. But, but I think that's the I think that's the deceit of, of certainly the. Uh, mainstream or right. leftist media i guess is mm -hmm. what we really should call it leftist media not mainstream mm -hmm. leftist media but social media i mean it's just creating these we talked about it with scott you know creating these um this deceit as to what we're really fighting against mm -hmm. right that's why i mentioned the republican thing they're fighting about like who's in leadership and like it doesn't matter at all it's actually not really the fight no i i it's possible that israel and hamas is actually a distraction from something else that's happening right i'm pretty positive it is yeah, and the, we had some, I mean, maybe even the theft of the election, right? In, in yeah. November 3rd. Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, sorry, YouTube. Now Wisconsin's auditing. Sorry, well, maybe. I don't, 
It's actually probably fake news. They they want to. I don't know that it's. Oh, they passed. want to. They haven't decided yet. Yeah, there was somebody missed. It was uh, okay. what's her name? Emerald. What's her name? Miss misreported it and then everybody mm. ran with it okay. which is kind of that's a problem with conservative press too they're mm-hmm. just as prone to do that uh but what was the point oh uh we're talking about november 6th right and mm-hmm. then well maybe that was actually you know you know trying to manipulate an election was actually covered for something else that was happening sure it's always possible yeah um because that that just keeps keeps you off, your eye off the ball well what's right. the actual ball right about you getting outed as a chinese operative no i i think it's even worse than that the the actual the actual uh, attack is on on family humanity well, civilization right, yeah, ultimately. right. Yeah. well no, it's not just ultimately but it's actually happening mm-hmm. on the side while no, you're I mean, busy over here. right now ultimately what's happening in the present tense to your point is that ultimately really what this is at root sorry I misspoke at root okay. really what this is That's an attack bad. on family and God <laughs> right and ult- and ultimately uh, in tribalism or or mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the autonomy of the state versus the federal government. I mean, you look at the way, what are we trying to do? We're trying to undermine the fabric of society. Why? Mm-hmm. So we can institute a different society. Correct. Right. And here's the hubris of it all. Of course, you know, the, the pride of man mm-hmm. is that um, somehow if we want to play God with society, that we're going to be able to do it in a way that's going to be constructive and beneficial. Right. Yeah. Or we're going to play God with medicine, you know, with, with yeah. medical technology. We're going right. to do it better than God did it. Right. Um, which, again, reading the scriptures, anytime... You know, like when Saul tries to be king in God's place, mm-hmm. he doesn't do he doesn't do a better yeah. job of it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it just gets worse. So right. that and I, that's the thing that I'm I guess fearful, eh, not in a like it's um, it terrifies me, but just in a sense of like it spurs me to action to say, mm-hmm. um, no, this is not acceptable. Mm-hmm. You know, not for my family. Right. You know, we serve the Lord and we care yeah. for our neighbors, and we're not gonna we're not gonna right. you know stand for this kind of. Uh, injustice i guess well, a lot of what injustice. you a lot of a lot of what is required mm. to go down this path is a lot of preparation for the fight so that when the fight happens you're ready for it mm-hmm. that's why you have that's to a, talk about it before it happens right. so that you, you talk can. about it you have to you have to it's like joe rogan talks about in a complete tangent but it kind of goes to the point too like rogan talks about you know people don't like to smoke marijuana because it makes him paranoid he's like that's the best part because mm. you're altogether too comfortable with your life and you need to be a little bit more paranoid so jumping off of that thought process people are way too comfortable with their lives and not paranoid enough about simple things right if i lose my job how am i going to provide for my family um because they're if, flying by the seat of their pants yeah. right every day every week is just go to work do what you need to do just get through the day Versus like, yeah, but what if, what if? I'm just saying, do you have a You can't a live in constant fear of, of the if. You can't unless you recognize that what's coming. Well, it's only, it's only fear. Well, I shouldn't say. You can live in fear of it, but, but if you don't well, take action, yeah. then it's actually just going to be debilitating. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's the problem is that you despair. end up. Despair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you withdraw from society. Um, maybe you end up drawing on your walls and scrawling, you know, in, uh, in, in nook and uh, ruins on your walls and wearing a tinfoil hat or something like that versus like no i literally have to engage in i have to engage the society and the culture in which i live in such a way that i take from it what is good and positive and mm-hmm. useful mm-hmm. and godly and then okay. reject the rest but yet in that rejection i still have to be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as a dove and i hang yeah. on that t- that verse from jesus a lot i talked about in the warrior priest podcast last week is Christians are not called to be wallflowers. We're not called to be doormats. We're not called mm-hmm. to be exploited and taken advantage of. But so much of American evangelical Christianity preaches that message. It's like, well, it's God's will, or it's just a mystery we can't know. Um, well, it's it's true that that we are treated as doormats, and you yeah. know, um, what was the other word? I can't remember the other thing you said. Pushovers. Pushover. Yeah. R- right. I mean, because doormats, cause wallflowers, we... whatever. That's that's one of the side effects of actually forgiving sins, is that yeah. some people will just trample on you as a result. Right. right? right. Well, that's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's what we talked about with Luther and, and the distinction between love and faith, though. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that we allow people to trample our faith thinking that's loving, but it's not. Mm. Because it's, it's faith. Yeah. They're trampling Christ. <laughs> well, and that's when you speak. That's when you right. have to speak. Exactly. You're compelled to speak. Right. There's good compelled speech right there. That's a good so. kind of compelled speech. I think so. 
It's like Luther says about, you know, when, when Satan tempts you and says, you must, you must, you say, I must not. No In all what. things, actually. In all things, exactly. Right. So I think the biggest part of, of the pastoral task that I, uh, pointing at myself rather than other guys, that I, I find lacking is you got to preach it. And you got to preach that you're, the Christians have spines and that the Lord calls you a lion as well as a sheep. Right. But he calls you a sheep in relation to himself and a lion in relation to your, in the world, in the neighbor. Hmm, that's good. And we, tend, and we tend to drop that off. Like it's in Proverbs, it's in other places. He's like, I, you know, I've called you lions. There's three things the Lord loves, you know, that you're bold as a lion. Over and over, it's that, that paradox of, well, you're a sheep and God's flock, but you're a lion when you walk through the world because God loves bold, courageous people that are like lions. Right. You are to be wise as a serpent, but as innocent as a dove, which serpents eat. So hmm. there's that paradox always of when you're interfacing with your neighbor, be cool, be kind, be forgiving. However, don't be dumb. Don't be, don't be willfully naive or blind to the fact that you're talking to someone who is a sinner, an old Adam sinner, and whether they're a person of faith or not, let's push that to the side for a second. This person, you need to be wise in the way of the world. You need to be street wise. You need to be wise in the way of, of just interpersonal communication and relationships and understand people are going to take advantage of you. They're going to treat you as lesser than or worthless because you're forgiving and kind. You right. give them the benefit of the doubt. You put the best construction on things. You don't engage in gossip with them. These are all negatives to most people. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise, yeah. what are we going to talk about if we're not gossiping or complaining? Um, we wouldn't have a podcast. <laughs> but the, yeah, but the point is that at some point, you're either going to have to testify to your faith in Jesus as God and Savior, or you're going to shut down. And... I know people from pastoral counseling who come to me and they're like, you know what? I had an opportunity to be a witness to, and I, I couldn't get it out. I was, I was embarrassed, pastor. I was actually embarrassed to talk about my faith. Okay. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. That's why I get paid to do it. <laughs> I suppose. Um, but there's also this, maybe, maybe it wasn't time to speak. That's what I tell them too. I'm like, it's the Holy Spirit who works in you for you didn't his have, good You pleasure. didn't have the words, then you didn't have the words. It exactly. wasn't time. And that's why I tell them. Like if the Holy Spirit didn't want you to talk, that's why you didn't talk. But you mm -hmm. know what? You can pray for him. You know what you can do? Pray that next time he gives you words. Mm -hmm. Or you can also accept the fact that maybe not you, but maybe the second, third, fourth, fifth person they run into today, the Holy Spirit's going to use them to preach the gospel. Yeah, exactly. And maybe you were just called to live in your vocation as a neighbor and just love them. Or maybe, Yeah, and by that you you prepare them in, in some way, right. right? To be receptive. Right, exactly. To and maybe, word. again, maybe you're an instrument of the law to tenderize them for the, the gospel to come, whatever it might be. <laughs> that that mallet with the little things right, on it. You know. <laughs> little spiky right, things on exactly. The little hammer. <laughs> quack, quack, quack. I guess that's kind of what so, we do here. Again, it's, it's the stuff that we see it, and I think at a gut level we recognize it, but we don't want to acknowledge that it's true because mm -hmm. it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like having to acknowledge that one of your kids is a drug addict. It's like you, you know they're a drug addict. You can tell from the way they look, their behavior, you know, all the things that all the excuses they make, or you just catch them doing drugs. And yet you love them because you're, you're their parent. And so you don't want to acknowledge that you raised a drug addict. And it's like, well, wait, one, you didn't raise a drug addict. And no. number two, you have nothing to do with this. Like they chose it and then that took care of control. Right. Of but them. by denying it, you shut yourself off from Correct. bringing any kind of corrective help. To yourself, first and foremost, to mm -hmm. live with the fact that you have an addict now who's a child and you want to save your child because, well, if you're a parent, that's kind of what you naturally want to do. Right. But yet you have to act against those instincts and not try and save them because you can't. Yeah. But to counsel that, you know, as a, as a concrete example, it's, it's simple, but it's just not easy because it's, you know, it's your child or it's your, your beloved, it's your spouse or it's a family member, whatever it might be, mom or dad. And it's like, yeah, my instincts tell me I got to stay clear of this. And yet my brain is telling me, you know, my reason is trying to say, well, yeah, but you know, you could help. And it's like, not if they nope. don't want it. Nope. No, nope. The best you can do is, uh, well, like you said, pray mm -hmm. and then uh, and ask the Holy Spirit to work. Exactly. And recognize that love isn't sappy, pappy crap.
And that sitting really? there and crying in front of them over and over again isn't going to change their mind. If it didn't work the first time, it's not going to work after that. Hmm. Although I have seen guys crack wide open because their grandkid came up to them and hugged them. Like I've seen interventions where like an old guy, his whole family sitting there crying and he's like stoic, frozen in place, just angry, like shaking with anger that they did this. And then the granddaughter comes up and hugs him and says, I love you, grandpa. And then boom, done. Huh. Straight huh. to rehab. <laughs> and you're like, exactly. Whoever has chosen coming, yeah. to yeah. do that. And exactly. Everybody in the room's like, holy crap. <laughs> right. You spend like three hours trying to convince this guy to get in a car and she hugs him and it, he gets in the car. That's all you needed, I guess. And that's the way it is in the, in, in the way of the spirits work though, too, is that, like I've said a lot of times, I was in the hospital on Christmas over Christmas. Like I wasn't even part of Christmas. And there were all these people that came to church over Christmas. And I'm like, well, you know, they saw my elder preach my sermon at Christmas time and it was disjointed and chaotic because I wasn't there and they were freaking out and they thought I was going to die. And, uh, and then they came back after I came back from being, getting out of the hospital and I'm a complete total physical wreck. And they kept coming back. I'm like, why hmm. do they keep coming back? <laughs> and it's like, because it's not about you, stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now I've gotten to the point in my vocation where I'm like, maybe I should try less. Because the less I try, the more people come to church. There may be something to that. Playing a game of chicken with the Lord. <laughs> so what we're saying is going to pastoral ministry because it promotes laziness and uh, you can cover it under the umbrella of faith. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then. <Yeah. laughs> Do what you want, or, see what happens. Yeah, do, yeah, exactly. Um, it worked for Jonah. So, Kind of. Kind of, exactly. Kind of, but not. kicking and screaming. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I got, I don't know, It's two, we're going on 208 on the live stream. So if you want to shut down, I'm cool. Go eat lunch, have some tacos. I'm ready. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to everyone who comes to church, whether it be at Gillespie's place or my place, because of the podcast. We appreciate that, and we hope that you can come regularly to be with us because it's a gift to us that you come it's a gift it is that keeps on giving because it lets us know that yeah this podcast is actually serving some use to somebody uh for their benefit so that's awesome so thank you again to scott for joining in the podcast today thanks to everybody who supports us and everything we do and uh yeah we'll talk to you next week Peace. thanks everybody yeah it was kind of fun you know scott put in a lot of effort it was great. He really did. I could, I he was super enthusiastic. Like for Scott, that was that was enthusiastic. I know. I should end the broadcast before I record too much of this. <laughs> yeah, there you go.